Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, April 12th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair. And uh, before we begin, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Here. Here. Present. Here. Present. Thank you. Um, so, the um, first item on the agenda, actually, I hear kids' voices outside. <laughs> so, um, there's supposed to be kids here, I think, maybe. Should I go one? check? Uh, for the week of the young child. Here. <laughs> here. So, oh, here they are. Hey. Okay, so our special guests have arrived. Um, uh, this is um, this is a time each year when we um, when we take a moment to recognize um, the week of the young child. And so I've got um, a proclamation to issue tonight in favor uh, in in honor of the week of the young child. I actually have two proclamations. Um, one. <laughs> What's that? The funny there's one. the there's the sort of adulty one, and then there's the funny one, like the kid one. So I'm hearing votes for the kid one. So we can um, the the adult one is on the city website. For anyone who wants to look at it. Um, so I'll read the um, I'll read the, uh, the the fun one in the interest of time. So um, the the it's entitled "Hooray Go Wild for the Week of the Young Child," with apologies and gratitude to Dr. Seuss. April 16th through the 20th, 2018. Whereas one child, two child, red child, blue child, whereas this one is a little wild, that one is a little mild, but wild, mild, or in leaf piles, we celebrate the week of the young child. Whereas there are some that like to run, run for fun in the warm spring sun, and what in spring could be more fun than celebrating young children? Whereas early years are the learning years where we can encourage hopes, not fears. Praise parents, teachers, caregivers with cheers for supporting our future chefs and engineers. Whereas from here to there, from, from here to there, brain building is happening everywhere. Now therefore I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim, last week is gone, last week was fun, this week is yet another one, this week is one to go hog wild and celebrate the week of the young child. In witness whereof I have set my hand and affixed the seal of the city of Northampton. So, um, I actually have multiple copies of it tonight, so for our guests, so you can give them to the kids afterwards. and. Um, do you want to say a few words about the early childhood and uh, please step to the podium? Yeah. What's that? Oh, sure, please. <coughs> well, hi, everyone. My name is Erica Frank, and I'm the early childhood outreach specialist, and I'm the new coordinator now this year for um, our coordinated family and community engagement grant, which is a mouthful. Uh, but I. I do a lot in the community and work with um, the kiddos at our schools as well. And as the mayor said, next week is the beginning of the week of, young, of the young child. We are um, starting with this lovely event right now. You'll see in the next uh, two weeks artwork all over the city. And we have about 30 businesses that are participating. They put up artwork from all of our community kiddos and then also our preschool and kindergarten kids here in the district. Um, and then um, if you happen to be driving by Jackson Street on the 28th of April, pop in between 9.30 and 11.30 because we have this fabulous festival for kids. Completely free, nothing to sell, nothing, nothing to buy, nothing to eat. It's pure fun. So come and check it out. And we have lots of people participating in that as well. And so um, we're just really... I'm happy, and I want to say on behalf of all of our littlest residents, um, we are so grateful and thankful that we have all of you um, 
as our champions for early childhood. And we live in an awesome town, and I um, feel very honored to be part of all of this. And um, I appreciate that very much because it helps with what we do. So, Josh. I just want to say thank you to Erica for all of the hard work that she does for our youngest residents as well as our esteemed faculty and preschool teachers and all of the ESPs and families and of course our students who help us celebrate every day how wonderful it is to be a young child and how we get to watch them grow over the course of the years. Um, and I also wanted to take this opportunity to present so each of the kiddos chose a book outside in the hallway as well um, of our favorite childhood books, Apollo Pal. <laughs> so the superintendent provost. <laughs> Bad case of the stripes. <laughs> um, hold it up. To hold it up. One of our favorite books, I guess, is fitting, and a piece of artwork to go with the story as well, to help us remember our youngest pals and friends. actually wanted to introduce, that's Apollo, and we have Leia, is, he's in preschool, Leia is in kindergarten, and Lane is in first grade. Guys, you can come over here and help me give these out. All right, you, they're attached, you can go to each person and give them one of those, okay? Thank you. Don't throw it, honey, just put it down. Thank, Thank you. you. Keep them attached and hand them out, maybe. <coughs> Thank you. Check with Things you should do. Thanks very much. So much. Thank you. All right. You did good. I got it. No, I think it's the same. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Lee, Lee. Yeah, then I would have. Lee, do you want some, some books? Really Thank you. Some books. Would you guys give us one to a cat? Would you give us one to a cat? Hello. Thank you. Would you give those? Would you give those? No, ma'am. I'm just going to say I'll give them to him. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Would someone like to come? Would someone like to come and pick up the proclamations? <laughs> I've got lots of copies of them, so we weren't sure how many kids were. So thank you. Do you want to slide that back in the library? Do you want to slide that one back in the library? Yes. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Um, I can assure you the meeting will all be downhill from here. <laughs> um, so uh, are there any announcements? Oh, well, first of all, we have the public comment period. Um, so I have a sign-up sheet. And um, the first person who is signed up on the list is Mary Clark. And uh, Mary, if you could just state your name and address for the record, and I'll, um, I'll run a timer in three minutes. If you can just keep your remarks to three minutes, please. I'll do my best. Mary Clark, 183 Riverside Drive. That's Florence, not Northampton. But um, I am aware of the one-to-one -one Chromebook issue that is being voted on and decided and talked about today. And I've worked to provide information to this panel and to anyone who would like to talk to me about it, about the possible harm that ex exposure to digital devices can be exposing our children to. Um, our local doctor, Teresa Ruggiero, an OD of Northampton Vision Specialists, has told me in her work that there is very strong data to connect screen time with macular degen degeneration, dry eye syndrome, headaches, fatigue, and myopia, such that 
as I wrote to many of you, the state of Maryland just unanimously passed a bill, Public Schools Health and Safety Best Practices Around Digital Devices. That bill recognizes the public health threat facing our children at school and speaks directly to preventing harm to students. It acknowledges the physical and psychological threats related to daily use of digital devices. This is especially true for very young children. I'm thinking of the 8 to 11 year olds in elementary school because children's visual systems maladapt very quickly <coughs> under unusual stresses and this is a stress that the human race has not faced yet is blue light retinal cell damage. Um, I love being in Northampton because Northampton is progressive, it's data driven, it's science based and it's so focused on the health of our students. You have an unparalleled opportunity now to put in some limits and some protections as you roll out this one-to-one -one plan and really look at what data there could be, what data there is, and how you want to set real limits to children's screen time every day, cumulative limits to reduce their exposure while all of this information is coming out in studies. Be Northampton, be who you are protect our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, the next person who has signed up is Jeremy Whalen. Hello, uh, Jeremy Whalen, 213 Russell Street in Hadley. And uh, as the mayor uh, has predicted, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> um, OK, I wanted to uh, first, um, we, I've been keeping this under wraps for a little bit. And she was like, don't say it. But uh, I'm really excited. Uh, we, Elena Fragamini are yours truly over here, uh, has won uh, a regional Emmy for best talent. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, has been a goal of ours in our just right at the start of um, communications and media production. We made that class. It was one of the goals. And to do that, not only do that, but do that in two years is just phenomenal. And I, and I applaud her for that. And uh, it's with that in mind that I come to you and talk in support of uh, the technology hardware initiative that is uh, before you tonight. Um, it's one of the things that when you look at the, uh, the uh, superintendent's budget it, and the surveys that were taken, it's one of the areas of most priority, uh, right under the student services and arts, which are arguably uh, intertwined in, those in that technology as well. Um, these things are, are meant to enhance the learning experience for students. I really put an emphasis on enhance. Uh, these technologies are not replacements. Uh, they're there uh, in order to uh, aid students uh, who may have different uh, parts of their individual educational plans or uh, different strengths uh, to perform at their and operate at their best. And also I had the opportunity from my, um, my privilege of being on school council to also sit with all of the school councils and, and talk about uh, some of the dr concerns around one-to-one -one, uh, in the implementation of that. Um, and some of those things that, that were brought up were screen time and other potential harmful effects in which uh, I can say that you know I fully support the scientifically backed limits in other protocols while at the same time uh, bringing these technologies in uh, and uh, understanding that technology is so ubiquitous within our society that we need to have a forward approach to these, uh, to, the, to the implementation of these and have the autonomy to do so uh, with that thoughtful approach from our district. Um, there, and the, uh, the other part of this as well um, is that these Chromebooks are something that we can decide on uh, internally. Usually the, the equipment that we're getting is external equipment. So uh, I fought tooth and nail to, to get the best possible software, the best possible computers, uh, the best possible camera equipment in, in my classes. But these are things that are, have been relied on from generous donations from Smith and a little bit of um, elbow grease into computers from uh, East Hampton and, 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 and that district. And these things I have to tailor curriculum to and tailor usage based on what is coming down the pipeline. And I don't have any um, assurances that these things are going to, to uh, be there. And so to have that ability, I think that this is really our chance to take the reins on implementation uh, and think about this large scale positive change in terms of how 
like bringing in that scientific, uh, scientific approach in, in a, a collaborative manner. Um, and I would like to thank uh, Molly McLaughlin, uh, Antonio Pagan, um, and uh, the superintendent for having that, uh, the school council meeting because it's something that has been uh, well deliberated on and the, the, these thoughts and concerns are things that uh, I know that a lot of the concerns that I've had have been addressed by uh, the technology team and uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited to see this, uh, to see what potential um, good can come of these, uh, this technology as well. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, is there anyone else who wishes to speak in the public comment session tonight? Okay, um, hearing none, are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Yes, Ms. Bisonski. Uh, thanks, I just wanted to um, let the public know that the Massachusetts Association of School Committees is having its annual day on the Hill on Wednesday, April 25th, and I will be attending along with, I think, a couple other school committee members. And uh, it's our chance to go and advocate with our representatives and also just get a sense of what is kind of happening in terms of school uh, funding, et cetera, and, you know, the difficult situation that we all know that we are in. So um, I think it's uh, great to show up and be counted. So just wanted to let everybody know that we will be doing that. Okay, thanks. Any other announcements? Okay, um, then we'll move on to the uh, next item, which is recommended actions. Um, we have a consent agenda that includes the approval of minutes of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee of March 14th, uh, the Superintendent Evaluation Team April 4th, the Budget and Property Subcommittee of April 5th. We also have several field trip requests, the NHS Outing Club backpacking along the Metacomet Monadnock Trail, Shootsbury <coughs> Irving Mass, April 16th through the 18th, 2018, uh, the track teams going to the Weston Twilight Invitational at Regis College, uh, Weston Mass, Mass on May 5th. Um, uh, again, the NHS um, Outing Club, Mount Monadnock State Park in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, May 20th. The NHS baseball team going to the Baseball Hall of Fame and games at Doubleday Field in Cooperstown, New York, May 22nd. The Leeds fourth grade going to the Connecticut Science Center in Hartford, Connecticut on May 30th. And the NHS outing club going to the Tully Lake Campground in Royalston, Massachusetts, June 1st through the 3rd. And I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Okay, the motion's made and seconded. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any in opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the consent agenda is adopted. Next, we move down to the reports and <coughs> recommendations, and we turn to our student representative, um, the Emmy Award winning <laughs> Elena Fragamini. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so in recent weeks, um, Northampton High students have been grappling with the discovery of structural modifications in the first floor Northampton High girls bathroom and the subsequent charges. Um, as much as this has felt like a violation for everyone who is part of our community, um, it has felt like a specific violation for those members of our school who use that girls bathroom and many students are in the process of dealing with that. For many students, it has been frustrating that so many of our questions simply cannot be answered due to the nature of investigations, but really have appreciated the opportunities to voice these questions and concerns that were offered by our administration during assemblies during the school day. The student union is currently in the process of brainstorming ways to continue to address the concerns that situations like these bring up, and we're exploring holding further student conversations and forums um, to continue to help our school community through this. Uh, the Student Union recently co-sponsored the Pioneer Valley March for Our Lives, which brought thousands of people marching down Elm Street and rallying at City Hall to join the fight against gun violence. Students who organized this march, which was co-sponsored by more than 15 schools and over 50 community organizations, have begun a new organization called Pioneer Valley Students for Gun Control, and they are seeking to continue the energy sparked by these displays of student organization. The Northampton High Key Club and Environmental Club will be hosting an Earth Day trash pickup on Sunday, April 22nd. So if you're looking for Earth Day plans, um, you can join them from 12.30 to 3. Um, they're meeting on the bike path behi behind the Northampton Stop and Shop and all are encouraged to attend. After the Northampton High musical was canceled this year, uh, some students at Northampton High have worked to form the new NHS Musical Theater Club. 
The club is currently working on songs to perform with the play Natural Shocks, which is a one-woman musical about gun control and domestic abuse, which is being performed across the country on April 20th, which is the anniversary of the Columbine shooting. The play will be performed at Northampton High uh, at 7 p.m. on Friday, April 20th. So encourage you all to attend and support this new club. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Next, we have a vote. Uh, this is on a field trip, uh, Ryan Road, grade four, uh, students to the Globe Student Research Symposium in Buffalo, New York, May 4th through the 6th. Um, and I believe it's not on the consent agenda because this is a new, a new trip. Um, and I believe is Ms. McLaughlin here to speak about it. Um, Ms. McLaughlin will, uh, will explain this one. Hi, folks. So what is happening is due to, uh, well, as a, as a nice accompaniment with the Global STEM program at Ryan Road, they have the opportunity, they had a grant offered to them to attend the Northeast section of a GLOBE symposium. And so the students have been working collectively to observe clouds and in comparison with their companions over in Ireland. And then what this symposium is, is you can take students to present that material and that data to at this like grand NASA GLOBE symposium over in Buffalo, New York. And so uh, we ask that that is something that can be approved. It would be something that um, almost all of the funding, I'm pretty sure all of the funding is covered under a grant that they did receive. And then these two, two representatives will go with um, parents and the t uh, Sarah Simmons, the fourth grade teacher, to present for the class. They have a trifold that they will then be able to share at their experience of what they have done it, with Northampton. Okay. Um, are there any questions uh, for Ms. Laughlin? Could I have a motion to approve this trip? Anybody? So moved. Thank you. Thank Second. you. Sir. Second. Okay. The motion's been uh, made and seconded to approve this uh, this field trip to Buffalo, New York. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The motion is approved. And Ms. McLaughlin, you should probably stay at the podium. I think you're. Uh, set the oh. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda <coughs> is a presentation by uh, Ms. McLaughlin on technology tools for in enhancing education program. So, um, Turn that row of lights off. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So, as you've heard from Public Forum, one of the agenda items today is regarding the technology tools for enhancing education program. And so, uh, today, what I'd like to go over are some of the questions that have been brought up as well as some information to explain overall what's going on in both a national, international, and local area. So many of you have already previewed this slideshow, but I'd like to go through the information that we have collected. And so uh, Antonio, I believe, also just left. Okay. He's here. He will be joining me in a minute as well. But this is a slide to talk about internationally what's happening. And so some of the discussion has been around why are we talking about Chromebooks? And we will continue discussing why Chromebooks throughout this, but I thought it was important to look at across the 
entire globe what the percentage of devices and how things are being displayed in the K-12 education system, what it looks like. And so you can see from this, internationally the rest of the world has a bit of a blend mostly with Android devices and Windows machines, whereas in the United States through till 2016, the this system has shifted more to be relatively even with micro, uh, with Office uh, PCs. However, you can see that steadily the Chromebook population has grown. You can see Mac OS has been a small percentage, and then um, the iOS devices such as iPads have been uh, maintaining relatively. It seems like a little bit of a decrease in the in the continued years, but right now the leading one is Chromebooks. I got this fun little clicker from my colleague, and just have to. There we go. All right, so then we talk about nationally what's happening. So the Consortium for School Networking is this company that does a lot around school security. Uh, many of us have had discussions in, in previous dialogues about which data is being pulled and whatnot. So one of the surveys that they gave was, okay, talk to us about district-wide what you're doing. So while it did not provide us with a direct number of how many people were interviewed, what it did show is overall 40% of the population right now is looking at a one-to-one -one model of one device per student. And then it shows collectively the gray is what that's going to look like over the next couple of years, in three years specifically. And so I added in there 40% uh, right now in, our, in those polled technology directors around the country. That's what that's looking like. Statewise, what's happening? So we have a couple different, I just looked at a couple different places around. Part of this is because we have been doing site visits, but also just communicating with colleagues that I know throughout the uh, Commonwealth, as well as looking into research. Um, I know like my cousins go to Peabody Public, and one of their neat models is they are actually implementing it middle and high, and then at high school, by the time they're seniors, they actually keep their device. But you can see across, there's a bit of a blend. Mostly it's one-to-one -one in Chromebooks. Largely, it does look 6 to 12 or 3 to 12, uh, which is the model that we are looking at. The blend that I've seen overall, also polling, I came from an education background, those of my peers that were educators, it seems uh, relatively Chromebook and um, iPad, but you can see in here, in this area, we do have quite a bit of activity with a one-to-one -one model. Statewide, or I'm sorry, locally-wise, we look Amherst offers one-to-one -one for, for grades 3 to 6 where they do not take them home, and grades seven through nine do take them home. They are working to increase one grade per year. This isn't uncommon that it gets rolled out at the middle school and then it increases as those students continue going throughout their high school experience. Um, and in this situation, Amherst does have iPads, but they do not have a one-to-one -one model with iPads. That is a device that is used intermittently with, you know, as students need that. Um, but they have been investing in the Chromebook model. At Frontier, similarly, they have 7 through 12, take them home. I can talk at, in depth about some of the different models they have. So some of the things that were concerns, um, we'll go into at later points in time from teachers. You know, what about if they're not charged? And there are a lot of different options for how to t handle that. At Frontier, I mentioned they have a charging station in the library. They have charging stations in cafeterias. They have like some that are there. There's like 15 that are in the library for loan if a student comes in and theirs is dead or if it gets broken. So there are a lot of different ways to address that need. Um, in the classroom as well. Hatfield's one-to-one -one Chromebooks, grades three to six, don't take them home. Gateway Regional, one-to-one -one Chromebooks, South Hadley. I was able to get information from the middle school, um, but I was not able to get information from the high school. So let's talk about what's happening at NPS. A couple things here, these are just some snapshots of some of the activities that are going on. And so you can see here, as, as <coughs> mentioned, we do have the Global STEM program going on right now at Jackson Street. We have the kids who are Zooming with the UK and India using their Chromebooks. We have in the middle, we have a feature of the blog uh, from Dynamac at the middle school where she does a lot of activities that show what is going to, ex what students can expect going into the class as well as interactive materials for those who aren't present and interactive materials for students when they get to the class. On the side, I also have an indication of that's New ZLA. Um, there's been discussion about that too, and I can elaborate on that as needed, but this is a program that offers current events that you can alter depending on Lexile level. And so this has been handy for some students. It also allows you to change the language into different languages so that they can still get access to current events. So let's talk about what our students are doing. I do need to turn on my
So while that was really quick, what I wanted um, folks to re realize and recognize is a lot of these activities that are showcased are things that are done on a Chromebook. So some of the things that you saw were global STEM, the interactions with students overseas, stop motion animation, all done on a Chromebook, and that was third grade Miss Bachman's class. There is animation robotics. There's coding that goes on. There are a number of different things that go on. Uh, the green screen, like I had mentioned previously, where kids get to present their facts in a way where they utilize uh, Wii video so that they can see like how much more interesting and engaging this material becomes when they get to see themselves with snowflakes dressed up in their winter suits behind um, their green screen. So what I have here is, as everybody knows, I did work for JFK for a number of years, so I have a, a really strong sense of what's going on there. And I can say that 30 teachers at JFK use a blog, website, or LMS. Ironically, as I love data, I had tracked over my five years of being there that it went from 15 to 21 to 30. And so one of the things that I did is I listed some of these blogs so that you have an op or websites, so you have an opportunity to see how students and teachers are utilizing this online presence. So one of the things that I think people often are concerned about is this idea of you know, just being attached to the screen and not being able to interact with it. Uh, one of, a lot of research indicates if you have passive interaction with screens, then the learning curve isn't quite as strong as when you're interacting and you're learning. And these are really great examples of the way teachers have utilized this screen, these screens and the Chromebooks to make learning interactive and fun. I also did a quick poll this week to find out, okay, what about at the high school? How many teachers are util utilizing there? I did get 19 responses that said yes, they were utilizing these, but there were only 31, so I don't know that that's necessarily as helpful as the information I have from the middle school. So then the question was, is, all right, well, let's talk about what are we doing with Chromebooks? <coughs> and, oh, Antonio, I got this fancy clicker thing that'll activate them. Okay. But you know, I know you like I know you like defining things with my trackpad. So you know, um, but yeah. So what we have is I did go around and I asked students. I said, talk to me about what it is that you like with a Chromebook. Tell me what what experiences you have that uh, keep you engaged with these devices. And so the first one is what the people in our schools are saying, both teachers and students. resources to find uh, information, how to use the databases to find information, and then we work um, a lot on how to safely use uh, wider internet-based resources um, for their research, how to check the source to see if it's something that they want to use. Um, a lot of what youth librarians are working on increasingly is the concept of how do you recognize what's uh, acceptable to use on the internet? How do you recognize fake news? How do you recognize fake sources? Stuff like that. Um, which is much, much easier to do. It's much, much easier to teach them about it um, when they can be actively involved looking at the same things that I'm looking at, looking at the same things that the kids are looking, the other kids are looking at. There's sort of only so much that if they're just watching me on the screen, they're really going to get out of it, as opposed to if they can be looking at it and analyzing it at the same time that I am. So this year, we've been using Chromebooks to assess students uh, almost on a weekly basis, where I set up some Google Forms. And we, we use a mix and match type system, where we do some review problems, some current problems, and some problems that are upcoming. And it's a way for us to kind of assess to see what kind of growth the students have had, uh, some areas of concern and kind of see what they know. So we've been able to use it to get the kids to 
focus really a little bit more on what they're learning and how they can um, take information from a screen and use paper and, and regular resources to help them kind of make that transition to, to using something like a computer. And uh, we've seen a lot of growth since the beginning of the year. Probably done anywhere from seven to eight, maybe nine activities on the Chromebook. And each time I usually show them the mean, the median, and the range. And the kids know that the closer the mean and median are, the more likely that we're taking our time to kind of work on it. So from, uh, from my standpoint, I think it's worked a little bit. The kids are a little bit more focused and enjoy working with it, kind of get the drill down how it works and seen their impulse control put out a little bit since we started. And, um, but I mostly like writing stories. Um, was it? it was in ELA and reading and we were just doing like heroes during these stories and like short stories and stuff. And I think we benefit a lot of middle school students in particular is it helps you become more organized. You can't lose that paper or that handout because it's right there in your drive. And so we can help teach the kids how to organize a electronic drive, which is probably still we're going to need moving forward. It's just like really hard to get your work done because I guess in high school a lot of stuff is like all online, like Google Classroom, Google Docs, um, everything is handmade online. Like we rarely even print stuff out nowadays. So like it's just like I don't know. <laughs> we use the computers a lot more. Like and some people um, don't have access. To them at home, so like they have to stay after. Like I, I didn't have a computer for a little while, and I stayed after till like six o'clock in the library here, getting some stuff done for like finals and stuff. But you, I have seen some people bring in their own Apple Chrome books. Like um, um, sometimes you can get stuff done on your phone. I know this one girl has Google Docs on her phone. That's probably really difficult. I remember doing that back where I used to live, and it was almost impossible. But you know, you gotta get it done somehow. Um, so for a presentation, I um, we would go on Chromebooks, and we were we well before that we were learning about um, the chemical table. What is it called? Periodic table. Of Periodic table. Yes. And, and then for me, it was sulfur. I found it very interesting, and I made a character, and I did a little bit of drawing and. Uh, I came out with this really cool character because I know how to like code and stuff so I came out with like this very cool character um, and it was a lot of fun yeah, and, uh, uh, he was smelly it was it was a lot of fun I learned a lot from the computers and it helps me uh, I try to I mean I try to incorporate technology as much as I can in my classes um, I think it's just really important that kids, I mean, kids are living in an age where, you know, when they're finished with school, they're going to need skills using computers anyways, especially once they get to high school. Um, and so I try to do as many research projects as I can where the students are, you know, surfing the web, um, using, you know, approved resources, and we talk a lot about credibility too, so, you know, we talk about the difference between just Googling something and finding a random website and you know how, how valid is the information on the website because there is a lot of junk on the internet. Now one of the things that I'd like to point out is overall every time that I was speaking to uh, teachers there was the emphasis on understanding responsible use and so this is one of the reasons that I feel like it's very important to consider this initiative because it gives students the opportunity at this level to understand how to responsibly use technology to understand what is a, is a good resource what is not a great resource we build it into our curriculum based on the standards about how to be a good digital citizen and how to properly utilize the internet and the tools that you can find there in an effective way. And so also with this next one, I asked some people in the surrounding areas as well as, like I said, reached out to other communities that I have connections with to, to share with me what it is that they feel they appreciate about their program with Chromebooks.
is that the kids have access to them at all times, which allows them to learn how to use them productively. Um, and we also still do a lot of other things. So it's almost like reading a book, I feel like. By having access to it, they're getting more used to it. They're learning how to use all the um, all this, the skills that they need in a computer world. So use it. we do not use them all the time. I actually, um, I was hesitant at first, but now that I see what it's done for the kids, they can type faster. Their, their ability to just use it independently is, is huge. I mean, we're not, like, it used to take a half an hour to get them all signed on. Now it's like, they can independently go and get on and start their work. So it's, it's huge. It's definitely, um, has been a big asset to the classroom. So this is a little bit hard to read, but I, as I said, I know you guys have looked at it before, and it discusses just how this has been something that has been successful. All right. Well, I, I love our Chrome with Cards we've had for three years now. Um, I was a great teacher. And, uh, one neat project we're doing is right now we're doing a invasive species project on um, invasive species in North America. And kids did all the research online, and they're putting together a Google slideshow. Um, so they're learning a lot of cool school skills, inserting uh, videos, putting information on the slides, designing them, putting links on them. So great project. Um, we don't use the Chromebooks all the time. Uh, but here and there, some days we go without using them at all. Other days we use them more. But uh, all in all, it's a, it's a great resource to have. possible for them to do real life activities the way that when they go into the workplace or they go into middle school or they go into high school, um, they wouldn't be expected to do that. And we expected to be able to have conversations on computers and they're going to be expected to cold what write on computers, not making a draft by hand and then writing and typing it on the computer. It's not the typing skill necessarily, but it's the idea of you know, getting ideas from their head to typing rather than written first and they're able to do that and practice that on a daily basis rather than just for test prep or just um, once they have that technology available to them at home, which a lot of them may not have. So one of the things that I think is important to recognize with this slide is that the emphasis that this is a resource, it's a tool that can be used, that is something that students are going to be expected to use. And so we're giving them the opportunity to learn how to use it in a safe and effective environment to then be prepared for when they go to college. Today I was at, I was at the Project Lead the Way grant convening session at uh, Worcester, uh, Worcester Institute of Technology. and. You know, I was t just looking at, I recognize it's a tech institute, but looking across at what's happening on a college campus and there are computers open everywhere. I called my mom up, she's a professor at Keene State in the education department and I said, mom, she said, Molly, I'm in the middle of a meeting. I said, great, are there professors there? And she said, yes, but we're in the middle of a meeting. I said, great, can you just tell me how many of you guys allow note taking to be taken in class on computers? And she said, we allow it as long as there aren't distractions and if we see distractions then we we will change the policy, or we would ask the student not to. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So now let's check out our district in terms of what's happening right now. And so many of you have already seen this, uh, this information regarding the access to Chromebooks. So teachers were asked, how, how often do you have difficulty ac accessing Chromebooks? Now right now we have a different breakdown between the middle school and the high school in terms of how many are available. But you can see overall, that there is still evidence that there is difficulty accessing them and there is a per small percentage of this pie graph that indicates I don't even bother trying to use them because it's so hard to get access to them. Now if we look at the opposite side, we're talking about student populations now, so that top section of green and blue students indicates we started a pilot program this year. And the pilot program said, okay, so let's see how many students if we provide 
five at JFK to loan out through the library, how many students would be in need, would be, in, would be interested in having access to this computer to check out for a period of time? And as you can see, based on those numbers, we have five Chromebooks and 46 students have signed up for the program with the expectation to check these out. Now, this is something that I put these sheets out in about probably January. So we're sitting at month four, and I wouldn't be surprised if I walked down to the JFK office right now. The envelope that I check every time I come by has more sheets in it. There's never been a day that I have gone by my mailbox at the high school or that envelope and haven't found more sheets to put in. Equally, you can see down at NHS, we started out with five there, but the population was so high with 83 students, we added a, an additional couple so that we could at least provide some degree. But that's still 83 students that are competing for nine Chromebooks. And uh, one of the clips that I took out of the previous video when we were asking the students is how difficult was it to get the student had participated in a, the loaning program, how difficult was it for you to get access? And she said, you know, I know that I cannot expect to get it, but what I can do is I can plan ahead, and if I know I'm going to in a little bit, sometimes I can ask the librarian to keep an eye out for one. And I tell my peers, don't expect that when you come in, you're going to have access. So you do still need to plan to get access from staying after, or she happened to go to the library often during lunch. But what she said is, you know, if another teacher took over the library, then they would have to leave. Oops, sorry, wrong side. Co-writer, a nice extension we'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> so what are teachers saying about Chromebooks? So having had, that, having had access to this resource, we have a lot of feedback coming in about, well, what do you think about these? And one of the things is, you know, they're reliable. I don't have to take time to move around class, move the class to a computer lab, settle them in again. Students can easily use them to, to uh, practice can be differentiated. There's a lot, a lot about how it's differentiated. We see more work actually completed and handed in. Allows, time to allows me to access the curriculum and utilize interactive components that would not be used without them. It's motivating for students. They like being able to sit anywhere in the classroom rather than being tied to a desktop. And one of the questions we also asked was, would you use Chromebooks more if you had increased access? And once again, we can see by the blue section that the overwhelming response is yes, they would. So let's take a deep dive for a minute into special education and looking at how Chromebooks support diverse student needs and provides timely data for teachers to use to guide academic and emotional health. So over here we have Liz Skelly, who is uh, part of the Language-Based Learning Disabilities Program at JFK. Oops, just kidding. This one I don't know how to go back. So one of the things that's really important to remember is when we talk about students with disability, we're talking about access, access to content of material. And so for some students, by having access to a Chromebook that they can use throughout the day, it gives them access to content that they previously did not have access to. And one of the important things that I'd like to emphasize is nobody in middle school and nobody in high school likes to stand out from their peers. I would say in my experience working with students both at the high school and the middle school, if given the opportunity to use assistive technology and nobody else has it, there's more of an inclination to say, no, I'm not interested. So just using headphones, for example, we had a situation where like headphones are too distracting for students. But if, if one student who can access content has a Chromebook, has access to content, and doesn't feel like he or she is standing out because all of the peers have the choice to use a Chromebook as well or are asked to use a Chromebook, then it becomes something that doesn't make somebody feel isolated or make them feel different, uh, which I think is really important during these developmental years where a lot of that peer feedback be can become pressure, can become very pressuring. Um, the other thing is I was talking to one of the teachers, I want to say at the middle school, but it could have been at the elementary school that mentioned that, you know, with utilizing Chromebooks, there are students that don't have things in their IEPs, don't have 504s, do not have any educational plans that still utilize a lot of the features that we'll talk about. The next video is from a principal at Veritas Prep in Springfield and just sharing what she had to say about their one to one. 
um, having their Chromebooks is incredibly helpful for accommodation. So built into the, the Google platform, you can get um, Google Reader so that students that need text to speech in order to access, um, say, you know, an article for history class or the packet that they're doing in reading class um, can get, we can set them up on, on Google Reader and they can have, um, you know, the computer speak to them, which is very helpful. And similarly, we can do um, text, sorry, speech to text so that students can talk in their microphones and have the computer generate text for those students who, um, who need that accommodation. And again, that's not many students, but it's incredibly helpful for them to feel included um, in the classroom. Also, just in terms of accommodations and access, the Chromebooks are, give students easy access to um, the dictionary, which, is, which can be helpful. Um, other than that, we, we limit the Chromebook use quite a bit. We do use it for our math um, fact practice. We use extra math, and we do math practice on Khan Academy. Um, so that's also um, an incredibly great, you know, important use of the Chromebooks. But definitely, definitely recommend that the Northampton School District um, if they have the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one technology ratio, that they go ahead and do that. So then I'd like to just look at some of the extensions and apps that our students do use. And so like I said, one of the things that this allows is this access. And so, you know, depending on the day, depending on the student, some of these tools become more or less effective for them. So I happen to be testing out the one that uh, says R and then the person who's like this. And these things are used for ELL, or students who English is a second language. Uh, and for me, it's, it helps me out because I am trying slowly to learn Spanish. And what it does is different ones will change different percentages of web content into Spanish. Some of it, well, in my case, I'm looking at Spanish, but you can change the language. For students who English is a second language, this gives them the opportunity to select what they would like to see in their native language and then be able to still interact with their peers on that same content. We have things like Google Read and Write. I think most of you are familiar with this tool, but I'm not 100% sure. This is something that our, our whole district has been utilizing and we have been going through each of the grade levels to teach students how to use this tool because it reaches a huge, um, huge set of needs. Uh, it covers things like how to do note taking and collect notes effectively on a web page. It does speech to text. It reduces out the distractions of the beautiful graphics that web designs do and just puts the text right there. It allows some simplification of text. It does uh, speech to text. It does vocabulary. It does dictionaries. It does a whole lot of things. Um, and there's a bunch of other ones there. We have ones to change contrast so that for some students being able to read something with a colored filter or in a different contrast really helps, again, access to information. Um, we have Beeline Reader that can be used that changes it throughout the, the text. And for certain learners, these different things help in the way that they access the written language. Uh, we have some writing support built in there, too. And then things across the bottom that students also use. So then we take a look at how Chromebooks help students with special needs from the teacher's point of view. And if we remember from the budget survey, the first priority was assisting in or creating some support in the budget for student services. And so when you look at the responses for what teachers like out of these, a lot of the responses that come are related to this idea of differentiation. And note that it also says without drawing attention to themselves. And that's the part that I'd really like to emphasize is while we know that these tools can be very helpful for some students, the option for other students to also benefit from them makes it so that people don't stand out when they don't wish to be standing out. It also talks about how students are able to complete the work at grade level with more independence. They can <coughs> work with the ability to slow down, rewind, etc., demonstrate understanding in different ways. One of the things I really liked at JFK that I saw is uh, one of the history, eighth grade history teachers, Faith Bisbee, would do a great job with making a Google form quiz. This is a side note from the next slide, but she would take a quiz and she would do it in different, and she would differentiate the Google form. And so, you know, maybe for one, it's more, uh, you're gonna be writing a paragraph essay in response to this. Maybe one is more graphic, maybe one is more multiple choice. And what she would do is she would email those forms out to students and she would say, when you come in, go to your inbox and get the Google form that I've emailed you. And so what it did is nobody knew what Google form they were taking. They were all taking a test. 
And what students were able to do is for those who wanted the accommodation, they could put headphones on and they could listen to that form read out loud to them. And so what I liked a lot about that was, A, she took the time to say, hey, I know that this is middle school and I don't want to sit there and pass out like, oh, you can take it from this pile, you're going to take it from this pile. This is like very anonymous. We're all taking a test on US history. And then you know, kids took what test was appropriate for them. Oops. Hey, that's a, a new tool. All right, this is Antonio here. Uh, good night. Um, I think most of you know me already. I'm uh, Antonio Pagan, CEO, CIO for the city. I would like to talk a little bit about, bef bef about myself before getting here. Um, so you know that I started with the city just uh, three years ago. I started with the schools a year ago, but you don't know that I have 30 years of experience on technology management, which half of them are on educational settings. So I have uh, a lot of experience on transitioning from different technologies because I started with you know very uh, primitive technology until uh, where we are today. So transitions is uh, something that I, I think I have a lot of experience with. And uh, one thing that I know about transition, I, it normally uh, takes a lot of time for people to adapt to uh, new technologies or, or new processes or new methodologies. And it's something that um, definitely takes a lot of time to uh, talk about it, have conversations, have dialogue, and trying to come to the best setting and the, the best transition process for it. So I'm, I'm very happy when uh, I was asked to participate in this process of trying to understand how um, the new tools are being used. And I, I try to avoid the word Chromebooks because this is not about Chromebooks. This is about new technologies that are going to be implemented that have been implemented already for several years that are changing the way that, um, that the pedagogy is being implemented and, and is being applied to, uh, to different programs that we run. So it's, it's not about a device. Um, one thing that I have learned uh, a lot on my, on my job is that when I'm trying to implement a new technology, I cannot focus on the appliance. I cannot focus on the device. Because the device is going to be here today. Three years from now, it could be obsolete. Five years ago, seven years ago, there was a lot of talking about doing one-to-one -one with iPads. Everybody was running with that, spending a lot of money. Where is that now? Very little districts are doing it. So the, the idea of focusing on a device is, I think, is, is misled, it's, and it's not the right thing. So I, I try to avoid doing that. The other thing that I think that you uh, should know also is I basically, because of my accent, you will understand that I'm part of a, a population that is growing in Western Massachusetts. And during the last 20 years, I've been working a lot with community-based organizations, helping students to really get into STEM uh, careers. And I have worked on several organizations on that. So I, I feel really uh, inclined to uh, advocate for anything that can help students or of all races and all kind of uh, uh, social uh, status to get into STEM-based uh, uh, careers. And that, that is something that I, I definitely work very hard uh, on my volunteer uh, time, which is a lot, almost the same as the, as the pay uh, uh, job. <laughs> That's why I'm late today. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one thing is, okay, let's look at how this impacts uh, the student learning. And this, this should be actually the focus of, of, of the conversation, at least that's what I would like, uh, like to be able to do. Um, for, the, uh, for the teachers, number one, uh, you have heard on the testimonies already, uh, teachers right now have to do a lot of logistic to be able to say, I can use a device or I can use a technology that can allow me to do small groups or can allow me to do uh, tier instruction or do all the things that are needed because of specific needs. And when you don't have the resources, that might hinder the whole purpose of helping a small group of, of students within a, a whole classroom. So that is something that definitely we need to think about. Right now, you have heard about it. It's not easy for, for teachers to use the technology because it's not available. The other thing is <clears throat> there are students that have devices at home, and that's great for them. And most likely, they will be able to continue the job with the kind of technology that we already have here that they can go back <coughs> home and finish something. But the students that don't have devices at home, they will not be able to do that. Because for example, if you have to finish an essay, it will be very hard to get a smartphone to do that. 
you, you will not be able, even for kids that are S a lot, when they are texting on the smartphones, they are not doing grammar. They are not doing really uh, the kind of uh, uh, writing that is needed for some of the projects. So, so they are not part of that kind of learning process. Uh, with this kind of program, they will be able to do it. And the teacher, not the student, not uh, Molly, not myself, will decide when is a good time for the kid to get the, the, the device home or not, or what age uh, is, is the one. So the other thing is, uh, Molly already talked about this, but there's a lot of uh, tools that are available um, on many devices that help uh, the language learning for all kinds of kids, but mostly for um, ESL kids. And on the other side is uh, we have really um, a many lack of resources in many ways. And I think one of the, uh, the students was talking about, you know, sometimes you have to go through a lot of books in order to find some information. And if you have access to a device that can give you the internet, definitely you, you will have a, a better time to do that. I want to give um, a little bit of a, a personal uh, history for, for, for you to understand why I'm so uh, excited about doing things like this. And I've done a lot of changes in many places, uh, educational or non-educational. When I was uh, at the high school, and I'm talking now 77, OK? So you, you can age me now. Uh, <laughs> when I was in high school, I had no idea what to do for a career. I was uh, part of a, a, a big family. Uh, my father was sick, um, uh, so we were going through a very difficult time. I was working from a very young age. So when I got to high school, my thinking was I would just go and get a job to get money in my pocket, because that's what, what is needed. But I had two teachers. One was a, a chemical engineer that was doing uh, chemistry, and one was uh, um, a very nice uh, teacher that was a physics teacher. Um, we're talking 77, so there was no computers. Okay. But this teacher actually looked at me and, and told me, I'm going to give you a slight rule. I'm not sure if you have seen that before. <laughs> I'm going to give you a slight rule to take home, because I think that you have the skills and you can develop more if you have it at home. That, it was an engineering slight rule. There's many type of slight rules. Uh, or not anymore, but it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and that fact that I took that home put me to think about going to engineering. And a few months later, I applied, and I got accepted on the best engineering school in the country. And that's the reason why I'm here today. So it was just one person taking care of offering an opportunity to a kid that made that change that completely changed my life. So I think that sometimes it doesn't look like um, getting a program like this to run is going to make changes, but I think it's going to change many, uh, not only students, but also teachers' lives. I have talked with a lot of educators in my lifetime, and the majority of them, when they talk about technology, they say, you know, it's two different experiences on education when I was not using technology and when I learned to use technology. Because it's, it's, it's about learning. I think that the teacher cannot be uh, successful teaching with technology if they don't learn technology first. And that's something that we can do this. How I use this thing. <laughs> OK, go ahead. Together. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we have, um, we're talking about the digital divide. There's been a lot of discussion <coughs> about that and what is the digital divide. And one of the articles that I linked in here is uh, talking about that the new digital divide is actually those who can use it and those who can't. And so, sort of what Antonio is referencing about this ability to be trained to properly use equipment so that we do get those unique, dynamic experiences that students get to engage with material versus when you don't really know what to do with it. Okay. So, so one thing that I have learned with uh, community-based organizations is that uh, disadvantaged students, and I'm going to focus a little more, more on, the, on the families, they actually have different values, different set of values, not because they are lacking the desire for the students to be successful, but because they have other priorities. They, they, their priorities might be, I want my kid to have a smartphone because I have three jobs, I'm not available, and if something happens, he needs to contact somebody right away. So that's why they have internet access on a smartphone. 
on, or it might be another reason for doing it. It's maybe because uh, the parent thinks I don't have enough quality time with my kid, so I should show some care by giving them some gadgets that they can use on the time that I'm not available. So there's a different set of values, and so we cannot assume that we, because uh, disadvantaged students have access to internet through a smartphone, they can use it for educational. One other thing is uh, most of these families that I come from, actually, uh, they don't have a literacy um, experience. So they, they, don't, they don't know about college. They don't know what is needed for getting to college. They don't know what is, uh, how is to basically use education as a way to be successful and to be proper, prosperous. And they basically don't have that to impart to their kids. So they need the support because uh, even though they, they have the desire, I remember my parents saying, you have to be better than us. You have to do, uh, you, are, you, know, you have to do something that you get better where, where we were before. But nobody told me, you know, if you don't go to college, you will end working on a job that is not going to pay as much. Nobody told me that because they didn't have that kind of comparison. So that is something that we have to be careful when, when we are uh, working on any kind of initiative with technology, whether uh, as we implement and we actually uh, distribute these uh, devices in, in, in the hands of kids, whether we are being equitable or not. And I think that that is, that is a very important piece. Um, and, and it's proven, I think, that there is a lot of research when, when you have kids on a program or a framework that is uh, of rigor and um, high stakes, they really step up and they really grow. And this um, kind of program that we are trying to implement and is being implemented already for a few years, uh, what it's doing is actually asking the students to be more engaged in their learning process. It's because they have to be uh, more responsible for not only the learning process, but also for the resources they are using. And that is something that they, they need to learn now uh, because when they, they go to college, it's too late to learn it. You, you need to have those skills before. So it's, it's very important uh, to do that. And I think that disadvantaged students in, in general are more likely to take advantage of these resources, but every student uh, will do it as well. And you can, you can read more there. So then if we look at what makes up the digital divide, and so there, the top five things are income, age, race, education, and physical abilities. On the side, I do show like what we're looking at when it comes to devices, so what percentage of people own what based on income. And overwhelmingly, those who make over 100,000 have many devices, whereas those who make under 30 obviously have to choose and pick or pick and choose a device and I would have to say that I would agree if I was going to, if I did not I've been in that situation where I did not make much income and I was you have to decide do you want to have your cell phone where you can reach people where you need to communicate or do you pay for internet actually I will say it is my first year now that I own a home paying for my internet um, and it's it's a bit of a shocker but anyway um, so there's that piece, but also we look at uh, income level and we look at age, we look at race. And so age is a pretty common one where uh, there are people who didn't grow up with technology, so ha there's a variation in who utilizes it currently. I will say that I probably get a monthly call from my aunt who turned 60 last year and she usually is asking for some support because in her in her career, they've they've switched everything into uh, computers, and so she needs some coaching on that because she didn't have that opportunity. But I also, when I go home to my parents, get a laundry list of things to teach them about, and so and that's fine. That's something that I like. I I find that that's enjoyable. I appreciate those who are looking to continue learning, but that's part of what makes up the digital divide. And as I mentioned, it's talking about who can use it and who cannot. And so, you know, we could throw all the technology at the world, but if we don't offer that training then that creates a bigger divide. And so that is a lot where the tech integration comes into play, and that's where uh, we have the tech integration specialists at the elementary school, we have the tech integration specialists at the high school and at the middle school. And just as a collective group, where as folks learn how to use this, they share that information. 
One of the things that's important to know is, um, you know, when it comes to professional development opportunities, the, these, uh, this team is out and they are doing workshops on the teacher work days and there are like hilarious texts that you can see on the different t tweets or Twitter feeds for the schools about, you know, they compete amongst each other for how many teachers they can get and is it the cookies or is it the content? But, you know, regardless, there are uh, teachers who are willing and interested in attending and when I was doing a summer program funded from NEF for the middle school staff. Year after year, we had over 20 people signing up. And they could be similar, you know, they could be people who had come the previous year. But what that builds is that builds a culture where that crew of trained individuals then brings that to their team, brings that to their departments, and then other teachers see what neat, you know, what neat tools are being implemented in their classrooms and they find out collectively and they teach one another so that we continue having these rich experiences. Some other statistics, currently 20 million students in the U.S. take online classes. So I mention this because I think it's important to recognize that, you know, right now if we look at if you did not have a computer at home, if I said, okay, all of you, your computer is no longer at home if you have one at home. And then we say, okay, you, when was the time that, you, when did you get to learn how to upload and download? items on the computer. When did you learn to navigate the trackpad? You know, I teased Antonio earlier with my new trackpad that if you press too hard, it defines things, you know. But that's because he doesn't use it all the time. It's my computer. So I get familiar with this piece of technology because I use it at home. I use it at school. I have to learn the way that this changed. If Pam gave me her new computer, I wouldn't have the first, you know, it would take me a learning curve too to say, okay, here's a new one, but you know what, I have familiarity with this trackpad, so I'm going to understand how to use this one. And it's that idea of the time spent with your device, with a tool that you know, that you get to navigate, you get to learn how to download, you get to learn how to properly, you know, make tabs and do this, because if you learn it once in middle school, or, you know, you get it reinforced one other time in a 45 minute block throughout school, as opposed to having that rich experience of that information reiterated, 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 and where you can try it, learn it, and fail, and fail forward so that you can learn and succeed in understanding the tool. That is the opportunity of that digital divide, where if we put computers and technology in the hands of students now, by the time they get to that point where they're in college, by the time they get to that point where they're in a career, they don't have to have that stumbling they can move a little bit further along. So one of the things I'm, that um, Ken Pransky had mentioned was this idea of, of a marathon. And so right now, a marathon is laid out by a certain population. You know exactly what the course is gonna look like. And certain students are already on that first starting point because they have the knowledge of how a computer works. They have a computer at home, they've navigated it, they understand how to transfer knowledge from one technology to the other. But then we have students who haven't had that opportunity that are starting behind the race. So not only do they not know what the path is going to look like, but they're starting behind because they don't have that digital literacy that puts them at the starting point. And my theory with this that is supported also with data is that gap that we're seeing, the digital divide that most people are talking about, it can be experienced, it can shrink here in a space where it, they don't have the impact of a professional career on the line or a college career on the line by having access to this technology. So research shows, as we all know, those of us who have been in education, there's always different perspectives on what's best. And so I have here a couple different statistics from various journals. We have the Department of Education and their technology plan emphasizing this need to continue to provide equity of access to technology. As many people have said, this is, as the teacher said, this is something students are going to be using. This is something that's not likely going to go away. And so the ability for us to have the opportunity to train students to use it responsibly, to use it in an effective way, is really what this is about. And so there's also evidence to say that on average, one-to-one -one laptop programs do have a statistically significant impact on student test scores. You see greater student engagement, better relationships between students and teachers, more student-centered and project-based instruction. Today I was at, as I said, the grant con a grant convention for Project Lead the Way, and the first thing that they had us start out doing was, as a table, we had a bag with paper and uh, cubes, and we had like five minutes to build a bridge out of this paper, and whoever had the longest bridge was the successful one. 
the idea being like this is what the students are going to do. They're going to be engaging in this problem solving, you know, project based thinking. And the computer is a tool that can help with that. Again, we have research showing that students who are utilizing technology do outperform non laptop students. But the big thing is, is teachers make the difference in the effectiveness. So again, it goes back to that training. When people know how to use this effectively, it allows them to have an effective program where students can utilize technology in creative and engaging ways. So we've had discussions about handwritten notes versus type notes. And so I did some research on this too. And I said, okay, so there's all kinds of articles. One of the ones that I looked at was Physician's Assistant um, Education Association. You can see the link at the top. And what it seems to me as it boils down to, the cognitive function of handwritten notes is different than the cognitive function with, with using a keyboard. So if we took aside the element of access, so you know, maybe on a particular day, keyboarding is very, I know for some students, myself included periodically, um, not due to utilizing it all the time, but just typing. You know, if, if, some, if a student has arthritis, that physical activity of typing can be painful, so speech to type might work. Or, um, you know, just students who need to utilize a keyboard to take notes. What is interesting to say is I put the columns in three where we have handwriting, the statistics that are like pro handwriting for how you learn, and then the statistics for pro type keyboarding and how you learn. And I mentioned earlier how I was, my uh, background was in art education and in special ed and how I always happened to fall asleep in my art history classes no matter what I did and how the technology helped me out a lot in taking notes and recording notes and whatnot. But what I thought was most interesting about this research is, yes, there is different cognitive function that happens on both, both situations. So by keyboarding, what it does is there's research that says, hey, you can, I can keyboard at like 101 words a minute, right? And so I can keep up with the lecture. I can type as fast as my lecturer is saying. So that's great. What that does is it frees up my active listening so that I'm able to listen to the content, which then goes into that whole encoding process and how that happens. Handwriting does a different thing where it's utilizing the cognitive process differently. And so in the argument pro handwriting is, you know, computers can be distracting. And as I said, as I referenced my mother saying, you know, if a kid's on Facebook while I'm talking in my class, and obviously that's a distraction. But this idea in the center with the star is that students, really the key piece when it comes to encoding information and when it comes to note taking is teaching how to take notes, teaching how to review notes. There's research that says students benefit when studying lecture notes that they didn't even take. And so that then says, okay, so keyboards or writing all together, that's not necessarily the piece that's the important piece to teach. The important piece is let's talk about the options. And when we talk about differentiation in our district, the, you, you can say, hey, here are the two things. You can try them both out. I'm in an online program right now, and I will do both. There are some days that I handwrite. There are some days that I, I take my notes on the computer. But I recognize the pros and cons of both. And in this, it doesn't mean that if a device is provided that we don't have the opportunity to also talk about doing handwritten notes. So that is just, again, just a point to say, you know, for everybody, choose what works best for you. But the emphasis from the teacher point of view, from, as a teaching point of view, is please recognize that taking the notes is only so good if you review the notes. So then let's talk about numbers and budget and future plans. Okay, here, um, again, let's, let's focus on, on transition here and, um, and see how these numbers work. Um, we, we definitely have some numbers here of how many devices we have um, throughout the district. And they are um, talking here about classroom, this, uh, classroom uh, computers. And definitely we have um, a good number of, of Windows devices. We, we use them at the classroom, we use them at, at the computer labs, and they are you know, uh, divided into, into those uh, two areas. Apple devices, most, mostly we have donated um, equipment from, from Smith uh, College and other places. And then the Chrome device, which has been growing during the last three to four years, um, we have almost uh, 1200, a little more than 1,200 um, in terms of uh, the total number of devices that we have in classrooms. Uh, what I would like you to look at on this one is, uh, as we transition from uh, a more uh, equipped uh, classroom or a more equipped building, for providing resources, we, we are getting to the point that we have a situation here that is uh, monetary. 
If you look at the uh, leftmost, uh, rightmost uh, column, that's the Windows uh, computers replacement. If we are going to replace all the computers that we have in the next four years, which is the recommended um, rate, uh, we will need about half a million dollars, which means if we increase the, the amount of uh, Windows machines uh, in a couple of years, we will be talking about uh, budgeting a, a million dollars in four years for replacing uh, our computers. That is not feasible, it's not sustainable really. We don't have that uh, amount of budget. We actually budget $60,000 a year. So in four years, it will be $240,000 uh, available for replacing computers, not only at the classroom, but also the admin uh, uh, staff and all, all the computers in, in, the, in the district. So it is a, a little bit of a, a conundrum there on how we are going to approach this. But definitely, um, we have to be careful on how we do it. Something that is happening now, and uh, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit later about that, is, is every time the industry is moving into a web-based um, computer environment. So basically, everything runs on a, on a browser. And that means that the need for having a computer like the Windows computers is diminishing at the workplace. Because we should be looking at the future and the workplace as we educate our kids and educate the teachers to do the, the job that they are doing. So just look at this a little bit until we see the, the next. Uh, OK, this is actually a little more uh, detail. And this is a projection. I, I have to warn you that making projections on technology is not a good business <laughs> because it, it could change on you on the next year. So. More or less, the, the green side, the, the, on the right side, the, the green is the capital money that was uh, requested and approved by, uh, by the city. And the other corals are the, the main three um, areas of hardware or software replacement that we use. As you can see, it's about 20% that we increase by putting this capital money into the mix. Um, without that, we will be... Uh, really uh, in, in bad shape in, uh, in order to get uh, where we need to be uh, in order to get enough resources for, for the technology integration that we are supporting. Um, but on the other side, you can see that, that we are spending a lot of money on things that are not computers or Chromebooks or iPads because in order to have technology integration that works, we need an infrastructure, we need switches, we need firewalls. We need um, uh, servers. So we need a lot of equipment, and we need software to manage all these devices. And the software actually is becoming more expensive than the, than the appliances. So we are focusing on, on one area only, but we have a lot of other areas that we are investing in order to keep the infrastructure running and the tech integration support. And I want to, to warn you that in that graph that you have there, the grants money is not, a, not, is not there because that's not a, a stable uh, uh, funding source. So I didn't put that in the mix. Sorry, I skipped yeah. ahead. And you no, all know I can't skip backwards yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, things we're thinking about and strategies to resolve. I do know you all have been sitting patiently, so I will kind of jump through these a little bit quickly. Um, we talk a lot about industry leaders and what they're looking for. So as Antonio referenced, the idea that you know now more and more things are going into the cloud. And so understanding how these systems work, when you're used to navigating a, a system that is cloud-based, such as Google, you find that in other areas as well, and that transferable knowledge. Additional skills, there's a lot of emphasis right now in the workplace of saying computational skills, problem-solving skills, that's what the work, workforce is looking for. Top, teachers con top teacher concerns, this is something that I emailed out to the teachers to address each of these areas, but ranking them, these were the areas that the teachers were concerned about, and as we discuss as a team how to address these, we have components that meet all of these needs when it becomes time to look at potential ways in which these can be rolled out. A couple things that we've been up to, attending conferences and sessions hearing other schools, talking with tech directors in local areas about successes and challenges, researching, discussions, professional development training, bi-weekly meetings. Some things that we offer when it comes to what we offer in the school, what we offer after hours, and parenting tips for, te uh, for uh, parents, tips for parents at home when it comes to utilizing the Chromebook. I'm gonna stay a little bit on this just because 
there are some key points that are important to know. To know. One, within the Google atmosphere in of itself, there's a level of filtering that can occur so that when you provide a student with a Chromebook, it does limit what students can go on to just based on the fact that they're within an organized student domain or within the organized K-12 domain. So that goes with them no matter what. If you're logging in at home, if you're logging in on the device, because you can't go further, that's, that's something that is um, definitely filtering things. We've looked at a company that also has a lot of really neat features that um, it's called Gaggle. And one of the things that they focus on is violations, questionable content, student situations, and how they filter these things through um, both an algorithm that's based on a computer scene, like, hey, does this seem like it's questionable content that's happening right now? Or is this something that then once it goes through the computer, it goes to a, a person who says, oh, you know what, no, this is a student who's studying this in health, it's okay, we don't need to worry about it. But if it is questionable content, then we're gonna contact, we're gonna send this, this information on to an adult and have them address that. And there are various different tiers of that. What I asked when I was talking with the district uh, tech coordinators around the area is like, let's talk about home use. And so yesterday I was on a site visit and one of the things that they do is they shut down the internet from 11 o'clock. The Chromebook is useless from 11 to 5. Plan accordingly, they say to their students. No, so that you don't need to be binge watching YouTube. Other schools have shut off YouTube altogether. Um, you can do that through various programs. Most schools, tech directors said, listen, it's not our job to parent the students. So our job is here, this is the device that we are providing. You have an acceptable use policy for what you're doing on it and then it is up to the parent to decide how to handle that from there. It is set up right now that students can't clear their history, so if you did want to see what they're doing at any time, you can see that. Um, but also we suggest, you know, like set some screen time expectations, see what your child's working on, interact, find out, you know, what is it that you're looking at. And one of the things I want to do is I want to offer parent nights so that parents can also come learn these tools so that they can then turn around and understand a little bit better what's happening. This is the last slide. It's leisure reading. One of the things um, that I really liked about this that I hope you do take an opportunity to watch is that YouTube video because what it really shows is how things change and how we have an opportunity at this point. Even though it was from 2011, it says, listen, let's look at what schools look like in 1820. Let's look at what schools look like now. Let's look at what the career industry wants, what the workforce, say we listen to Lieutenant Governor Pilotti? Pilotti. 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 that's it. And she was saying, you know, it's really important right now. We as a commonwealth really need to get these skills from our students. And these skills are these computational skills. And how important that is and ways in which we can teach that is through utilizing a lot of different things, one of which is technology. So I would suggest highly that you take a look at that, even though it was from 2011. Um, check out some of these great resources. We have a nice little makerspace uh, icon from Leeds School and then just some of the statistics. And thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you very much, um, so much. Ms. McLaughlin and Mr. Pagan. Um, so the, um, that was the presentation, and uh, we now have on the agenda a discussion and vote uh, relative to the uh, capital improvement funds uh, provided by the city for the, uh, for the purchase of uh, Chromebooks, which I think is why we're having this conversation. So um, discussion, thoughts? Or a motion, for that matter. People feel like. Yes, Mr. Question, I, I think for you, Mayor Narkowitz, if you can, can you explain what parameters exist in terms of um, where we stand with the capital with um, capital improvement budget? Is this where this money is going to? It's not really a budget. Um, what happened is the city. Uh, every year, I'm required by charter to put together a capital improvement program. Yeah. Um, which is a five-year. Uh, look at all the things that we need in the in the, the city and in our schools um, departments including the school department both both school departments Smith Oak and uh, NPS um, submit a set of uh, requests and then we attempt to prioritize and try to figure out how we can fund them um, and then within each fiscal year uh, I then um, go through uh, and and determine which things we can fund and how we can fund them and I bring individual orders to the city council. Yep. They're very specific. They're actually usually project specific 
to the projects that are in the uh, capital improvement program. Yeah. Um, and then those monies are either sometimes it's you know sometimes it's a borrowing authorization for larger projects or other times it's a, you know it's a straight appropriation of funding that we have in some source, whether it's a stabilization account or whatever it is. Um, and those projects are again very specific. And, um, and so oftentimes the department will, uh, you know, maybe the DPW, it's to buy, a dump tr you know, buy dump trucks or something like that. In this case, it was, you know, to purchase Chromebooks is right. what the literal order said. Sometimes it's to replace a school roof at Leeds School or whatever it is. Okay. So the parameters are that it's appropriated for that purpose and that purpose only. Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Thank yeah. you also for supporting schools. Thank you very yeah. much for that. Um, so, so a couple of real specific questions then. Are we discussing one year of budgeting, which I think in the, it was like 160 maybe in, in the second year. There's two different, there's two different funding streams. Are we um, discussing combined tonight or one in terms of how that fits into your dissemination of funds? And what flexibility when you talk about, like, I saw the application, it's a few sentences, it's not very robust, so are you leaving some of, you know, obviously there's a lot more attention and a lot more details people have been thinking about, are you leaving it up to us to decide uh, more specifically on how the money, you know, what we're going to purchase, how it's going to be disseminated and stuff? Well, there's an application and then actually the departments go before a committee that I put together yeah. and give a more robust presentation. It's okay. a, the, the descriptions are somewhat short because they're in a document that's a huge document. Okay. So they provide any supplemental or background information. So, um, but in terms of, you know, it, it really, it depends on the type of a project it is, but in terms of, oh, for, this one. Yeah. for this one, it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty straightforward purchase. Okay. I, I would equate it to, um, you know, purchasing a very specific equipment, uh, you know, a new tractor for Forbes Library, which we just voted on. Um, and literally the order uh, describes exactly what it is the purchase is for. Okay. So, and then um, would that be for one year or two years for tonight? So the multi-year plan, um, this was the first year of funding under a plan, which I think is a two-year program. Right. So um, they would have to we, we sort of reset the whole process again every year. Um, and so uh, every department then has to resubmit um, all of its projects again. Even though we put it on a five year plan yep. and said in year, you know, in FY19, which is you know, July 1, we're going to try to do these projects. And then FY20, we're going to do these projects. Really, the only thing we funded for now is FY19. Right. Um, and again, things change and needs change and you know uh, a project that you thought you needed there may be some new project that's a higher priority so for right now the funding that's been approved um, is for the was for what was presented for sort of the phase one of this project okay. for FY19 okay. or the, in the FY19 column yep. of that five fiscal year uh, project. Thank you. And how long do we have to spend that? Um, in this case you know we typically work uh, you know, it depends from project to project. It, uh, for something that's like a straight purchase, um, we generally want to see it spent in the in the same fiscal year. Um, if it's, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes, you know, the DPW is going to need to do a, you know, a major sewer line replacement. We know there's going to be months and months of engineering and then months of months of, you know, bidding designs. And so it'll often slip into like two construction seasons to have it done. Right. So there's often for large scale projects or, you know, the major roof replacement projects that we did uh, through MSBA. Right. Um, but in terms of just per straight up purchasing of equipment and, you know, we do a lot of it. Um, in IT, we do a lot of it, you know, whether it's copier, you know, copying machine replacements, uh, you know, straight up things like, you know, we're, we're replacing a, a tractor or something like that. Um, generally, we want to see that happen in the same fiscal <coughs> year. Right. Um, and often what times what happens is we, you know, if a project doesn't happen for some reason, uh, or the department decides, you know, we thought we were going to need that piece of equipment, we've decided we've moved away from that. Um, then we basically pull that those funds back and it goes back into the pool of 
funding again because we, you know, we have sort of precious resources in terms of what we can spend on capital. So if they're not able to do that project, then they basically, basically the funding comes back and then they have to compete again in that capital process and right. submit for, you know, whatever the new need is. And we really allocate that project. And you'll often see in the capital plan, in the capital program itself from year to year, you'll see that some of the funding that we're saying we're going to use to fund projects is often reprogrammed funds that, that were for a project that either didn't use all the funds or, you know, uh, or didn't happen, and so we're reprogramming it to right. another to another purpose. Okay, Thanks but very much. but again, it's it has to be um, it has to go back through that process and be recommended, and and eventually have some kind of a an order uh, that's approved for either an appropriation or a borrowing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Fragamini. Yeah. So this is more of a question for Ms. McLaughlin and I guess the committee. Um, I guess and this just might be me, like not totally getting this, but to me it seems like there's two definitions of one-to-one. -one. There's the definition of that we have the Chromebooks for, that could be for every student, and then the kind of the second definition is that every student is assigned a, a Chromebook and that it, it's more like a, a distribution. I guess my question is a distribution question. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering what is really being proposed in terms of distribution. So there are a number of different options for how you, they get distributed. Would you want to come to the podium just so that you'll be on video? Sure. So there are a number of different options for distribution. So part of the planning is looking at a number of different options for how this can be rolled out and what is the most feasible for each building and what works for both the teachers, the students, and the administrators for what they see is the need at that building. And so for instance, at the middle school, some discussion has, has initially started around like maybe this is, it's available, a student gets assigned a number, pick it up in the morning, use it for the day, drop it off in the evening. You know, Milford, that was their model, is they said, okay, kids come in, if they wanna take it home, they can take it home, they pay a insurance fee on it, but otherwise, students come in in the morning, get it from the library, they use it through, throughout the day, return it at the end of the day. Now, at other buildings, you know, like Amherst said, you know, this group, they don't take it home. This group takes it home. And so part of the job of the IT team and the tech integration team is to say, here are the models that we've looked at. Here are what we would recommend. Here is choice. So as a building administrator, as, you know, teachers, here are what we're looking at that you know, we funneled it down to let's say two or three and give us your feedback, see what you, what you feel is the best fit for your building and then taking that information and then going, you know, at the end, it's the administrator who says, okay, I think that this would be the best fit and then working to see what that means. So when you say there's two def definitions, there is a definite, the idea is that there is a device available for every student that would, you know, whether it means that they have the number assigned to them for the school day, whether that means that that device can go with them to and from the school I was at uh, a couple days ago, they have the same Chromebook assigned to them for five years. At the end of the spring, at every spring break, they return it. At the end of the spring break, they pick it up and they do not get to, there's a lot with inventory to make sure like, hey, if I trade mine with yours, because I was like, haha, I slipped, you know, snuck it out of your backpack. At the end of the day, there's a serial number, it gets assigned back to you. Summer comes, you return your Chromebook. The beginning of the, new, uh, the year, there's that responsibility of ownership to say, I'm getting that same Chromebook back, and so maybe putting stickers all over it is not the best choice because me stickering it up in seventh grade may feel very different in a couple of years, um, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of different options, and that is something that that planning process entails, is looking at the options, seeing what's the best fit for each building. So I guess, and I, of course, was, I met with you many times and spoke to the student union many times about this. And just to give the committee some student union perspective, and I do just want to say right off the bat, the student union is not a representative sample of the socioeconomic and learning diversity <laughs> of our school, and that's a challenge. Um, and we very <coughs> much do recognize the need for expanded tech, and I spoke to teachers too who were discussing like literally fighting over Chromebooks and how hard that is as a teacher and in a learning environment. Um, and for me, it's just, I feel like I wouldn't be doing my job as a student representative if I didn't look at those 83 students who are trying to check them out 
and there's not enough Chromebooks for them to be able to do their homework at home. And as a tech student, I would not be able to do half of the things I do without a computer at home. So I think it is important for the student union to recognize that. Um, at the same time, it's really hard to be able to um, evaluate this idea of one-on-one -on -one when we don't really know what it will look like at our high school. Because um, I think that the students, it, it's, it's impossible for us to develop an, an opinion on, on this program because we don't know if every student will be assigned their own or if it's a checkout library program. And I think for the student union, that's very much where they want to be able to have an opinion on and want to be able to have their voice in there. Um, and to me, it just seems like two very separate issues of having the Chromebooks and using this money to purchase increased technology, um, which everyone in our union agrees and even spoke to you want more technology. Um, we're planning on hopefully working with Ms. McLaughlin to do a student technology needs survey um, because so many students were, as this Chromebook issue was brought, were brought up, was saying, well, we want more than that. We want to be able to use these software programs and all of these other kinds of technology. So looking at ways to supplement that. Um, so at the same time, I, I don't know. And it seems like that maybe those conversations haven't necessarily been decided or concluded about how one-to-one um, -one will be distributed at the school. Um, and I guess I just I wish I had more of an idea of how it would actually be implemented at Northampton High. Yeah, I think that's one of those questions that as the team progresses through the process, we would be happy in the same way that you know at the high school we're looking to increase. So this year you all received like 139 additional. So number-wise, the middle school is matched a little bit more proportionally with the percentage of students there. And so it, I have absolutely no problem saying to the students and getting their opinion too when the time comes that we narrow this down to like here are some options saying, okay, students give your feedback. Just like now it's like, okay, here are, like I sent an email out maybe two months ago that was, that was saying like, okay, these were the top concerns teachers that you had. Let me talk to you about so far in the planning process what we are looking at to address these needs. And so, I, as I mentioned, I'm happy to talk to people anytime about tech. I mean, I love going to the PTO and the collective PTO, just having conversations. I'm always open to that, and I'm always open to feedback. So if that, you know, when that time comes, when we get the, you know, like here's more what we're looking at, having that student feedback is not a problem in terms of us being interested in hearing. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I, I'm just trying to be efficient. Um, so thank you. I want to thank you. Um, so last meeting this came up, I think it was the first time the committee really talked about this at all in this format. And pretty quickly after, we had a conference phone call with Antonio and Molly and Ms. Busansky and Dr. Provost and myself. And for me, that was really the first conversation about this and starting to learn about what we do and I have learned so much and thank you for your presentation I can and all the questions people are answering when I email them um, and I have a really different understanding of this technology in our district right now and across and you know I think everyone's holding their breath like what is she gonna say is she for it or against it and I'm not for or against anything other than of course we want to put technology in the hands of these kids and let them learn and do what the high school students need to do and of course we want to support every special ed kid who needs technology and they should have a Chromebook access whenever they need it and of course the kids who don't have access on those lists should have a library loaning program where they all get a Chromebook every time and don't have to worry about getting it and it's great that we have money that we can maybe do this stuff and where I'm still really struggling is understanding why we need a Chromebook one-to-one -one exactly for everyone. And I'm not saying we don't. I'm just not understanding it well enough. Um, I think we're doing really great things. I've heard from a lot of teachers. I'm thrilled that these kids are writing well and what they're able to do with this stuff. Okay. At the same time where I feel like I'm not quite ready to say absolute full-out one-to-one Chromebook program is the cost. And um, if we look at the cost, I, I, I want, I, so I, we've looked at the numbers of Chromebooks we already have. We looked at where they are. I've really learned a lot. I think we all got an email I'll share with the public. Um, from my perspective, I was really surprised how many already exist in the elementary schools, but I don't think they're, um, 
uh, placed in exactly the same proportions across the elementary schools and looking at these numbers across Northampton right now from third to fifth grade with the numbers we were given we have better than a one-to-one -one program there are more Chromebooks than students from third to fifth grade and it's different at some of the schools so I'm generalizing um, and there clearly needs to be some changes made the middle school seems to be lacking. Um, teachers need them more often. We need to figure that out. And the high school, for, I don't understand. I'm, I think it's lacking in some ways. There's a lot of other kinds of computers. In the stuff that Antonio provided us, it was really great because it talked about the need to learn more than just the Chromebook, learn how to use a Mac, learn how to use a Windows operating system, all this stuff. Mr. Whalen does isn't doable on a Chromebook. So I think this is a really big conversation because if we get I'll add to it, if there's 2,000 students that need Chromebooks, um, I think we also have to give the teachers Chromebooks, and that's, that's 225 more Chromebooks. So I just, I want to say I think we need to have more of this kind of conversation and figure out what the needs are, what our goals are with this, and then what can we afford? And just, Antonio said we have a $60,000 budget right now to replace this stuff. And a really, I think a very conservative estimate I think we need probably if we had a one-to-one -one program and gave the teachers also, which they clearly need, that's 23 to 2,400 Chromebooks. So I'm going to do the engineering thing. Let's say it's 2,000. It's less than what we really need. And everything I can find, these Chromebooks supposedly last three to five years. Most districts assume four. Let's assume five. Let's give it every benefit of the doubt. That means that on average we need to replace, you know, effectively 400 Chromebooks each year. And we can all throw different numbers out, but um, whether it's 210 or 250, I'm going to choose 250 because the math's super easy. That's $100,000 a year, and that's a lot more than 60,000. And I don't know, after pouring over this budget, I just don't know where that money is going to come from because we're already using the 60,000 to keep up all this other stuff we have. And, and you know, there's some trade offs. I'm sure some of this stuff will become obsolete. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, I. What I haven't really been convinced of is the need for absolute one-to-one -one and why we can't share a little bit. And I don't know how many we need. Of course we should take the city's money and use it for technology in our schools. But exactly how we use it, um, I'm still not totally convinced of. And I'm almost done. But the, the article you shared about the statistical significance of how one-to-one la -one laptop programs help improve students' academic achievements, it's true. And then it says, However, the effect of using laptops overall was noticeably less than the effect of other established interventions, such as smaller class sizes or individual tutoring. And I just want us to keep that in mind that we, as Ms. Busansky said two months ago, we don't want to be in the position of having to get rid of teachers and other support staff for Chromebooks. And I don't understand the numbers well enough to say if we really are in a position to do a one-to-one -one program. So that's where I'm at. Anyone else? Uh, I should say that some of that money is actually, some of the money we're using this year is actually um, Smith College money uh, that they gave us as part of our, don't call it a pilot, pilot agreement. Um, so there's a, there's a yeah, so we're actually, the hundred, about 100,000 uh, we're dedicating to this, pro this project because we wanted to use their funds for education. So it's a combination of city money and also that money from Smith College. Um, Ms. Busansky. Uh, I have a couple questions that I have. Thank you very much for the presentation and all of the time and information, everything um, that you've given us for this. I think it's been really helpful. It's been really helpful to have a community, some community airing of this. When it was first presented uh, to us in November, we were told this was not going to be for elementary school at all. And then it came out that in February that actually it was, and eventually it's going to be, you know, next year, middle and high, the year after it'll be third through fifth grade. So I think there's been airing of a lot of important information and I'm really, um, I'm really glad about that. And um, I mean, I guess I could just echo what um, Dr. Voss said, but you know, I clearly we've received a lot of emails from teachers. It's clear the, that we need more technology in the schools. I understand that clearly. It's um, all the benefits, everything that's good that comes out of it. Um, but with that, I think we have to be continually in questioning what it is that um, where those kind of challenges are and how we're going to deal with them and so I do have concerns around we haven't even you know the social emotional 
um, issues around screen time, the health concerns that the parent, Mary Clark, brought up in our public comment. And I think those are things that we should really, as a district, be looking at, and um, especially as an IT department. Um, I also really feel like um, I want to, well, I guess my questions really revolve around what kind of firewalls do we have, what kind of monitoring do we have? Um, at home and at school, and if you could maybe talk to that for a minute. I mean, I know from talking to a number of middle school and high school parents since uh, students since this rolled out that um, that kids are, are playing games during class, right? They had to scrub the NHS server of, um, oh my God, what's Fortnite, right, recently, right? That kids in middle school are playing games, right? And so how are we monitoring that? And how are we, what are we doing about that? Because to me, to, if we're gonna purchase these devices, um, first and foremost, you know, we should make sure that they're really just being used for educational purposes. And while I appreciated what you said about, I don't know if I can really recreate it accurately about, um, uh, you could turn, we could turn the Chromebooks off from 11 at night to five in the morning, or what kind of level of kind of involvement do we wanna have with these Chromebooks? I do feel it's incumbent upon us to, um, if we're purchasing these devices, right, um, that we make sure that they're being used for educational purposes only at home and at school. And I think it's kind of our responsibility, according to the E-rate money that we take to pay, to pay for, I mean, there's like a lot of things, a lot of information out there about why that is our, would be our responsibility or is already since we have all these Chromebooks and we're lending them out, so. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, Antonio can speak also towards the filtering, but. Uh, one of the things that I heard at a meeting with, uh, as I said, the tech directors at different schools, the interesting thing that they found is a lot of company, a lot of schools, almost all of the sites that I visited use a program called GoGuardian. Now, whether that's if they're taking it home or if they're using it in the class, that's a software package that offers certain controls. Um, one of the things that that offers is this kind of an alert system. Can I interrupt you for one second? What do we use currently? Okay, so, so we have all right. So right now we have school, right. We have Chrome. We send Chromebooks home. So what do we use currently? Okay, in school or out of school or both? Both. Okay, so in school right now we have a Sophos filtering system, and Antonio okay. can speak a little bit more specifically about that. And that's what filters through a lot of like inappropriate websites, like that they can't do that. Right now, because of utilizing the Google Education Suite, that is different from any other Google Suite because you have to Google has to rely on the laws based on the you know, Child Protection Acts where they cannot utilize the data for any other purposes. So for myself who has like four Gmail accounts, they can do whatever they want with the information I utilize under that because that's, that's not protected under child laws. But within the K-12 domain, there's a certain level of security. So for instance, Google Earth, in order for us to allow students to utilize Google Earth when they log into their Chrome account, I have to, as a Google administrator, I have to slide a bar that says, only students over 18 are gonna use it. And I can apply that to specific groups of students. So there's a level of control that happens just within the Chrome environment, which is what I was referring to when you take your computer home, you have a level of like, you can't access YouTube videos that, you know, there's a certain filter within that. So every, you know, when I was in JFK, the big game was still the world. You know, it still pops up. Right now it's Fortnite, that still pops up, you know? And so as these games become a distraction, that goes into our filtering. I can't anticipate, obviously, what I don't have any, you know, I don't have a kid to tell me, oh, this is the new hot and popular game that's going to distract me in class. But that is a piece that, you know, as we hear about those, we filter those in, both through the main firewall that's built into the school system, but also through the Chrome network so that when it goes off campus, when they log in. Does that help answer that? Mm -hmm. And okay. so, uh-huh. Okay, so where we can go. Oh, sorry, so one more, do, and do we have Clever currently? We do have Clever. Okay, so that's a monitoring. So, that okay, so what Clever does, Clever works for the younger students, and what it does, it tells you what amount of time. It's not a monitoring system, mm -hmm. it, but it tells you when a kid, so we have it implemented for kids K to give or take five, but mostly K to four where kids use a badge to badge in to their computer so they don't have to remember like M McLaughlin da 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 and type all that in when they're just learning the alphabet or just learning their keyboarding skills. So that can tell you how frequently those kids are in. But the other thing that we also offer is when students are in, like if, if, I, wanted, if I pulled up a kid right now, I could tell you how many, when they were last active, how often they've been on, what they've gone to, what sites, what, you know, whether it was Saturday, whether it was Sunday, what device they were on. 
So that's built within the Google domain. Clever tells you for the younger students how often they're in. So with the statistics that Dr. Provo shared, one particular parent asked us how long a Jackson Street student had been accessing the internet. And so it's f fairly simple when it comes to the younger grades to be able to say, okay, here's the Clever portal. Here is a blanket statement of how often these grades have logged in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But it's not meant to be like, you have, you know, like, yes, you get that information. So we, that's not don't, have mon we don't have monitoring software to see what websites our kids, that you, students have been on and all You can, because you can log, I can at any you given can time, you can at any given time log into your student's account, look at their history, they cannot erase it. We but took away. So, so teachers can at any day. Teachers can, but we also have. What websites were my students looking at? They could, the if they wanted to know, they absolutely uh -huh. could do that. Also, we incorporated a thing called Insight in our classrooms. And so when a good example is when I was a tech inter integration specialist, I would just put it up on the board. Kids would come into the lab, and here on the board are all 25 computers, and it shows you what they're on. Uh -huh. So kid wants to go look up shoes in that period, it's pretty evident that the kid's looking up shoes or playing a game. You can freeze the kid's computer so that if you feel like a kid is playing a game, freeze the kid's computer from your station, walk over, the kid can't move the mouse, it's very apparent that the student is not on task. Now, with that, there are additional things that you can use, such as GoGuardian or Gaggle, things like that, which can give you, if you want it as a teacher, to have it even easier for you, where you don't have to look in the kid's history, mm -hmm. it will print you a list of what all the sites were on that the, that the students were on at the end of your class period. So as Antonia mentioned, there are a number of different software options that can take things even a step further beyond what we have. But right now, we, ha we do have insight. This is something that as part of the um, concern about classroom management that, student that teachers were concerned about for that reason. You know, like there's, I, I struggle a little bit with that because there are certainly, there's certainly the opportunity where, as we said, we are teaching students how to use devices responsibly. Part of this in, in and offering students the opportunity to use technology is offering them the opportunity to also decide to be on task or off task. In the same way that I could take notes and draw pictures the whole time that you're talking. I could scribble whatever I want. But I'm giving them the opportunity to utilize a tool to enhance their education, just like I'm giving them the opportunity to take notes with, you know, in whatever way, shape, or form. And so teaching also that responsibility and that acceptable use to say, listen, while you're in this class, my expectations are that you're utilizing these websites. That's part of also the training that goes into saying, we're giving this technology and let's talk about utilizing it responsibly. But we do have filters in place right now so that they can also get monitored. And what about the distraction to the kids? I mean, I don't know. I'm, let's, I just feel like it's a big distraction to the kids around them. So I don't think it's the same thing as like doodling. And I think we do tell kids what's accept. We do go beyond that. We don't say you can just be late whenever you want. It's your responsibility. You, can, you will lose a course credit if you're late or you're absent after a certain point. There are some, uh, you know, sticks out there anyway whatever. and teachers can choose to do that I have seen teachers that say you mm -hmm. are off task so I'm removing mm -hmm. this device and now you are doing the same activity in a less engaging way off to the side mm -hmm. so that is an option I mean it's you know it's classroom management and, and part of the concern and part of the thing that we are addressing with teachers too is saying this is just like anything else and the same the same rules apply here are some tools to support you as a mm -hmm. teacher in classroom management but also you get to decide if your students are using the technology inappropriately how do you want to respond to that and you can take that up different tiers in the same way that as as a district we've accepted an acceptable use policy that if you're violating the acceptable use policy i know i've had times where students are not allowed to use the internet they've been you know, if they didn't you do, do something appropriate, you know, they violated this, then they have, like, other districts call it uh, internet jail, where, like, the kid can't do something. So there are a lot of different ways that we can address that, too. So, and we're looking at, con you know, we continue to look at additional options beyond just what we have. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds good. I mean, I'm glad you're working on it and, you know, that there are these different tools. I guess, you know, Overall, I'll just second what, you know, Dr. Voss said, which is I'm concerned that we don't have the budget to support this program moving forward. We certainly have the budget. We certainly, with the capital improvement funds, we can um, accept the money, we can purchase this technology, but I don't fully understand. We've never been really presented with what exactly the plan is and then what is the budget to support that over the next five years. And that's really what I'm the most worried about with this entire program and I think that um, 
I totally appreciate being able to see that implementation plan, being able to see that five-year budget of exactly how we're going to support this. I mean, we've heard numerous times that, you know, 2021, we're headed over the cliff financially and that we're going to be having to make some, potentially make some really hard decisions. And I agree that I think that um, I don't want this to come down to choosing technology or a one-to-one -one laptop program over other important things that our school system really needs. And so I, I just think that's an important piece to all this. And taking the money, I think we need to be responsible and show exactly how we're going to support this financially. And I think even Antonio had referred in his presentation to that it's not quite all figured out. And I think that's an important part of this. What, it, what are we proposing? What's this rollout going to look like? How is it going to be impl implemented? And as you said, in answer to Ms. Fragamini's question, you know, you're still working on that. I understand that. But what's it going to look like? And then how are we going to support that over the next five to seven years? That, to me, just feels really critical to all of this. Do I answer that one? Or is that your comment? Okay. So no. it's, uh, above your pay Thank grade. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Mr. Meyer? So I, I just have a short list. I mean, the first thing about sustainability, I mean, I, I agree with you. Um, the entire budget is not sustainable. So I don't know why I would pick out tech expenditures as being the one to focus on. The other thing is that, yeah, four years is nice, but as someone who works in a school district that has 11-year-old computers that are still limping along, at the end of five years, the, they don't disappear. I mean, they become less useful. They may not run all the latest software. Um, but most of them still work. And that's where you know, your tech staff begins to scavenge parts from some to keep others running. It's not ideal, but I think, as a school committee member, that I would vote for that course over laying off teachers, obviously, because the interventions that Ms. Voss said, you know, smaller class sizes are critical. They have a greater advantage than having the tech. Um, the next thing is you know, non-transferable. Um, when I looked at the $160,000, I thought we could buy two years of start time. Yeah. Okay, which again, we're talking about the health effects of this, which I think are important. Um, but at the same time, we have the American Academy of Pediatrics telling us that we're doing something irresponsible, but somehow we couldn't come up with $80,000 and a $40 million expenditure to, to change that. Um, the other thing is, I just noticed the irony of this debate is being conducted by individuals who are doing all sorts of wonderful research online. I mean, I really, would, I really would ask how many of us went to a library and pulled a reader's guide to periodical, the paper, you know, the paper version, and then went and pulled from the stacks of journals, as we used to do in the old days. Um, so we're all doing this research online, and then we're communicating online. So we're emailing back and forth. Um, you know, you're, so what we're saying is we are using these skills that we take for granted, but you know, when we want to put off bringing this to students in, in the schools. Um, I have an extremely bright student this year who, he's a junior, he's taking an introductory computer science class, and he didn't know what the word software meant. So, and you know, as a computer science teacher, I'm thinking, if you're getting to junior year and those kind of really basic definitions, you've never crossed that bridge, you're way behind. Um, and I don't want our students in Northampton to be that far behind. Um, you know, again, about, about, you know, macular degeneration, uh, you know, again, the internet makes us all instant experts. Dr., you know, Dr. Provost looked at it and looked at some of the same research and said it seems to be close work in general that has the effect on inducing myopia. Um, as I look around at all of the glasses here. Um, and, so, and so whether we're staring at screens that are 16 inches away or whether we're staring at a book that's four inches away, um, that may be related. The other thing is that, unfortunately, for you know, people wanting to avoid macular degeneration, if you send your kids outside, you're hurting them. Because there's another study that says that there's a long-term relationship with an adjusted risk ro ratio of five for macular degeneration of people who work outdoors. So if you say, get off the screens and go play outside, if they're not wearing their sunglasses, right? So I mean, again, we're not, all, we're not all the experts. And I guess this gets me to my last point, which is I'm a tech educator. I could tell you a lot of stories about the frustrations of trying to um, deploy software, even use web-based tools across different devices. Um, even the frustration, Ms. McLaughlin's 
comment about using different computers. As a, as a programming instructor, I go from keyboard to keyboard. And on my you know, trusty MacBook, I'm pretty good. But even the feel of the keyboard, when I'm trying to keyboard and stuff over kids' shoulders, um, it's, it's really difficult. Um, and so just the benefit of having standardization as a teacher, knowing confidently that something that some other teacher has used in another district, if they've used it on Chromebooks, I can deploy it with, with minimal input. Um, without the, ang the tech anxiety, which is that, um, you know, again, this is the thing. When, when your whiteboard marker fails, you pull out another whiteboard marker. Um, but when tech fails, a lot of times it's a show stop stopper. As I might, you know, I point out to my kids, you know, electronics is binary. It's off or on. It's zeros or ones. So, you know, you've got 25 kids and you're all ready to teach a lesson plan. And then, you know, Wi-Fi doesn't work. And suddenly... Suddenly, you have 30 seconds to come up with another great idea for the next 80-minute block. Um, and I, I guess I want to say, uh, I'd like to trust, again, as a school committee member, we do have ultimate authority over accepting this. Um, of course, the city council has ultimate authority over actually appropriating it um, at the, you know, after the mayor's request. But I mean, I can't, uh, I can't tell you how impressed I was with the presentation, the depth of the research, um, the I, I think that our staff at the coordinating level, um, you know, Mr. Bagan and Ms. McLaughlin, our building administrators, and all the way down through the feedback that I've gotten through emails from teachers, is that, again, tech deployed unthoughtfully is just flushing money down the drain. And I have a friend of mine, one of my oldest friends in teaching, who is a, uh, he's a tech integration specialist. And he was working at a school, went, which, decided to go one-to-one -one iPads. And at the time, he just was like, this is, I don't know why they're doing this. I, I, I'm trying to push back as the tech integration specialist, but the head of school has just gotten, you know, like this is what we're gonna do. Um, and so I think if you looked at the graphic on iOS, um, that decreasing share of iOS is basically the iPad launch failure. Um, and, and, you know, now people are shifting to a different platform. Um, so, you know, I think for me, it's hard for me, even with the experience I have, to say I'm going to turn down this money based on the information that I've developed, given the recommendation that I'm receiving from our professional staff. And again, as a school committee member, I think that it's really important that um, we do give due weight to what we hear from the staff who have given, you know, and decades, right, decades in, in education and trying to understand the interrelationship of education and technology and to do it thoughtfully and effectively. And again, um, you know, to trust that teachers will use this tool when they're provided with it in the most effective way and to not use it when it's not the best way. And again, one of the things I really like about, you know, the Chromebooks is it's very easy to just have the students do that and then it's, it's gone. Right? They, can't, they can't sneak it open. And I, as a teacher, um, honestly, you know, in, in teaching with technology, the level of engagement that my students have in those classes is, um, makes it very easy. You know, first of all, I have a, a student, who, I'm a teacher actually, who is in the next room over. She watches my robotics class because it's during her prep. And what she you know, has said to me is, it's amazing to see how you're moving around to the different teams and, and they're staying focused on the task. Um, I have students in a classroom that are doing web design. And again, it would be a perfect opportunity for them to play Slitherio um, or to wander off because I'm actually telling them to go get web content to pull into their web pages. Um, but again, as I wander around um, or if I use Pharonix Insight, and the nice thing about Insight is you don't even have to get up from the, from the you know, you can just type the message in. You know, Ryan, please stop that. I'm watching you. Okay. <laughs> and so, you know, then Ryan's like, oh. <clears throat> right. um, so, you know, I think that, I think that the benefits here um, are really, really important to take advantage of this district. Um, I think we've thought about the costs. I think we will continue to think about the costs um, and, and keep pushing forward with this as long as it's a net benefit. Ms. Hennessy? I'm going to use my glasses a little bit. Um, so I'm a Luddite. 
so and I've read the newspapers and books, so I'm, I really wasn't using my computer for this. So I have concern, and I trust the teachers, but the more versus one on one was my real big um, sticking point for me, as well as the cost. I believe in the usefulness of technology. I worry, and, and Downey said this about um, technology being employed thoughtfully. And I do trust teachers, but I think I need we need to trust the district to support the teachers and the training for that. So I worry about that a little bit because sometimes I see us, and I'm going to include myself in this as a teacher, getting so excited and a little bit. Um, overwhelmed with the technology and we have to do this and you should use this and this and then we our students aren't learn I mean we have 61 percent of people not knowing and millennials not knowing what the Holocaust is and 31 percent don't never heard of Auschwitz we're not teaching some things anymore and we're venerating technology as though it's a panacea and we need to talk about the social emotional issues I really believe we do and I'm, I support this. I'm never not going to take money from the, from the district. But I really, at that same point, I think we're at a crucial point. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to, cr I loved your presentation. I love's a strong word. It was really interesting. Um, but I get caught, because I, I see this a lot with students. Uh, the boy was so excited about using technology, but he didn't remember periodic table. Mm -hmm. That was what the lesson was, I bet. I see this all the time. They get caught up in Adobe Voice or this project and this. And they tell me all the music they heard, and this was put together. And I think that's so exciting. But then they, they're they not knowing what Auschwitz is. I mean, they're not getting that content. And, and that's where we need to, as school committee members, give teachers the tools, not just the physical tools of technology, but the, the tools how to use the technology properly. And that's where I worry about the cost. More importantly, I worry about the social emotional um, issues. Um, so I am a Luddite purely, and like by definition, I, I, I don't love technology um, personally, so I worry about it. I would never refuse money from you, but I think this is a, a bigger conversation that we really need to engage in as a, as a committee and as a district. Um, I just want to be clear. The district asked for the money. Yeah, no. <laughs> like I said, I just want to be clear. I, um, I, I, um, can I recognize Mr. Coppin because he Absolutely. hasn't said anything? So I'll go to Mr. Coppin first, then go back to Ms. Voss. Um, <laughs> So I have a lot on my mind, but I'm gonna, I'll make it quick. I mean, I, 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 a couple of months ago, there was a discussion around this. I'm not, I, I, I feel like I, I know a lot about education. I've worked in education for over 30 years. This is not an area I know that much about. So my immediate reaction was, of course, I'm a big fan of technology. I've used technology. I had a clone of an Apple II. I was the only one in the country who had one of those. But um, what I love and what I appreciate is my colleagues bringing this up and you guys looking into this and expanding the conversation. I mean, I think this is the way, uh, I, I think I hope and expect that this is the way we, we talk about these big money items. I mean, we vote on a $1,000 field book. We should vote on a $320,000, what have you. Um, so I, I just think that for something this size that has, I think, fundamental impact on current teaching and learning and future teaching and learning and potential budgetary items, thank you, everybody, for, for thinking about this. And hopefully the work that Molly and Antonio and the rest of you put together just kind of formulated your ideas a little bit further, got you ready for purchase if we're going to do that and what have you. But um, so all of that is great. For me, what's, what sticks out currently is some of the doubts I had have been satisfied. Um, some of the concerns I had, if you will, have been satisfied. But the two things that stick out the most have been brought up already. I'll just repeat them. One is that for me, and I do believe the majority of teachers, based on what we've received and what I've heard, the majority of folks see a, a, a system where kids are taking, are given laptops, Chromebooks, either in the morning and return or they take home. I do think they see that as fundamentally different than expanding the number of Chromebooks, if you will, in the classroom. I see it that way. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of kids bringing it home, and it might just be because I don't have enough experience. I know hundreds of thousands of kids are doing it. I know some school districts are doing it, but I would need more information to really support that idea. And um, I really value the idea that you want to bring this out to schools and ask them, but as someone who's making a decision about accepting this, I. I it, it just feels like that would be really much more comforting to know what that actually means for kids to take this home. For me, that opens up a whole Pandora's box of concerns about a whole number of things, much less whether it's an effective use of funding. In terms of Chromebooks, expanding the number of Chromebooks, I, I think that more or less I've come to the idea that that's a no-brainer. 
Teachers want this. Uh, they want more access. They have more control. We have more control. To me, that's not really as different. So that's, that's where my head is at with that. Uh, and I really think that we need a more, more definitive information on what schools have decided before this is implemented. That would be my preference, at least. And the second is funding. Um, I know we're getting these virtually for free, but you know, as a, they're not for free. The money, I live in Ward 6, there's a lot of constituents that ask me a lot, and when I ran for, for service, I knocked on many, many doors, and there's a lot of people who don't understand schools, but they understand the budget, and there's a lot of skepticism about waste of money, and I don't want to be in a position where I have to argue with them about whether this money should have been used for something else, and if it ends up in the front page of the paper, it will that's what we'll get and I want to feel really comfortable I really want to support this but when you start putting money into something and you're expanding the number of Chromebooks or laptops it just naturally means that if you want to make good use of it we're going to have to support teachers more and I love the idea we have ed tech people but maybe we'll need more we're going to have, need to maintain these things software is not free the Google stuff is free a lot of the stuff isn't what if Google adds a price to this which they do charge on some software um, I just need more information on that. I'm not trying to dispute it, but it is kind of cloudy so far, and I would love Dr. Provost and, and Candy to be involved in helping us understand the budget, because frankly, this needs to come, I think, from central office, from your office, to say this is how we're going to pay for it. I know you're confident. I just would, I would, I would like to feel equally as confident, and I think just moving in that direction of kind of looking at the budget short and long term, um, I don't want to start something and then stop it, because we can't afford it anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, particularly if we can use the money better now. So that's where I stand. Those are the two major issues, but a lot of the other discussion has alleviated some concerns I had. Thank you for that, and everybody else for raising the issues. And, and thank you. Um, I was going to say something quite similar, so now I'll be a little shorter. Um, but I would echo exactly what we just heard and maybe be slightly more specific and say, I don't know how many Chromebooks we need to add to this district to meet teacher and student need. And that, for me, is the first question. And the second question is then, how much does it cost? And how is important is that compared to other things? And I think um, I've watched this committee operate. I'm part of it now. But we are not good as a group at long-term planning. And this is a big long-term commitment. And I guess I'd like to slow down just a little, take a few months and come up with the plan. Let the experts tell us, this is how many Chromebooks we need. This is what one-to-one -one means. We agree we, we can't afford one-to-one. -one. Maybe we can. And how is it going to influence the budget? And I just don't, I don't see a negative in doing that. I feel like we really need to do that. And I made a little list when Mr. Meyer was speaking, because I, I guess I wanted to just share a couple more rele relevant things. I, too, am a teacher. And I am in technology. I teach <coughs> engineering. And I talk to my students. I'm lucky to have small enough classes. I get to know them really well. And this whole process has taught me a lot. I, the last month, have been engaging in a way that I never realized I needed to about how they're reading. Since the last meeting, I've really paid attention to this. Um, I'm making them carry their textbooks to class. We are reading them together. It is a skill they acknowledge they can't do. It's part of this new generation. And we, as people responsible for educating the ki these kids, all collectively need to just acknowledge that and work with them. Um, reading on the screen, I've now read all this literature. It's new. It's in the last couple of years. It's different. And they don't, you, in, it's 500 words. If it's less than 500 words, a news article, read it on the screen. Hard technical stuff, probably other fields too, um, you need to be able to read it in text in order to comprehend it, to remember it, to truly learn it. And I think that's new. I mean, this is new literature. I, it's new to me in the last month. Um, I'm now offering to print students their reading when I teach. I, we're reading a big, long New Yorker article for Monday. I printed it out for all of my, my class. I said, who wants it printed? They all took it. They all said, I will understand it better. They don't print it because it costs them money to print it. So you know, just to share, I'm learning. And I think these are really important conversations. Um, in terms of the way we teach computer science, and I teach programming in my classes, Students never sit one-to-one -one at a computer and program. Um, the term in the field is paired programming. There's all sorts of articles about it. 
You're much better off conversing and sitting there and working on it together. I agree, sometimes you need one-to-one -to, -one to write papers and do independent work, but there's a lot of stuff that goes on on these computers that is not one-to-one. -one. Um, and finally, just a few specific things. Um, the Chromebooks appear, I don't think they're gonna last for 11 years. Um, <laughs> They have, what I read is a five year expiration, so Google won't keep their software up, or won't promise to keep it up past five years, and maybe that's you know, not true anymore, but that was what I read um, from 2016, I think. And finally, I, I sitting here and we all got, I don't, um, I hadn't known Mary Clark till she sent us her email, but I thought it was really thoughtful, and I think I feel like I need to say something about the macular degeneration and the, physical stuff because I am concerned about kids spending too much time on, on laptops and I do trust the teachers but especially in the middle and high school when you're going to several different classes during the day I don't think one adult in their life is paying attention to how much time they're spending on the computer and um, I thought she wrote us an incredibly thoughtful email and we got an email back about macular degeneration and I read the articles and they were completely unrelated to what she was saying. I read those articles and what they said is young kids um, need to be in the sunlight to develop their eyes properly and there was some interesting research and I, I read the articles, I looked for the word screen or computer, they were not in any of them um, and then I looked into some other things she shared with us. Maryland just passed a law because kids eyes absorb blue light differently than adult eyes. And there's true concern. It was unanimously passed in the, in the Maryland um, State House and Senate that they had to be careful about exposure to screen. So I actually am really thankful she brought that to our attention. And I think we should um, acknowledge that that was really important stuff, so. Okay. Any other, um, any other discussion? Is anyone? I'm going to go, go ahead and make a motion. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Ms. Busanski. Sorry. Just, uh, so I had kind of, I had been thinking of making an amendment. Well, I guess I have a one, so I kind of want to clarify what the vote is on first. So we are voting to keep the capital improvement funds to the city for fiscal year 19. Is that accurate? So that would be the 176,800? Or to uh, return the capital improvement. Or to concept. return, right. but it has to be a vote on one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So, but it's just for fiscal year 19 for that $176,800. That's all that's been appropriated. That's all that's been appropriated. Nothing else has been So then the proposal, or whatever you would call it, for fiscal year 20, the 152000 that would be brought again by the Capital Improvements Committee to the mayor who would then, we go, we start over. The process right? starts all over again, yeah. So, I, so I'd like to, um, I hope we can have a better process around that. And we're not sitting here a year from now and having this conversation after you've already brought it to the city council, after the city council has already approved it. And I'd like us to be able to discuss it as a committee and get community feedback on it before it gets, uh, I, I don't know, gets to your desk. I'm not sure where in the process or how that would work, so not familiar enough with it, but maybe you could give us. We start, um, um, we, we start requesting uh, capital information from departments like in October. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, we, we begin the process in early fall and there's sort of a deadline that people have to submit um, their stuff. And then we convene um, an advisory group, uh, sort of an ad hoc uh, group that I put together to help me screen these projects. Um, it includes a representative from the city council and the school committee. Um, and then actually we have um, uh, citizens, uh, you know, citizens that help me do this, that, uh, you know, are, some of them work in facilities, some of them work in other fields. And so, uh, and they interview the department heads and then they prioritize them. And so the long and short of it is I have to get all of this done and then reassembled to put in a plan that is usually due in um, uh, March of every year um, so it's a it's a long process <coughs> and um, so usually the school departments being asked you know to submit something by like October time frame October you know sometimes November I think I think when we talked about this last November it was because you had gone before the committee I think mm -hmm. at that point and presented everything 
Um, and so it was like an update that we had gone, that the department had come before this committee and presented, you know, its projects. So then maybe, Dr. Provost, I should be asking you if it's possible to bring this request, the, whatever the request is going to look like for fiscal year 20, to if there's a one-to-one, -one, if there's a second part one-to-one -one laptop request to us for discussion before it goes to the mayor. Is that possible? It's certainly possible. I think that rather than trying to cherry-pick projects that may be controversial, um, maybe the, there should be a different process for submitting the whole capital plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is this is the process that has been followed as long as I've been here I'm sure many years and prior to that and um, has been without controversy until now so I guess I would I would not necessarily trust myself to anticipate what could later turn out to be controversial we could present the whole thing for a more thorough discussion than we do mm -hmm. okay thank you for that and then I had thought I would um, Make an amendment to the, uh, I guess I hope I'm getting this right. I'm so bad at Robert's rules order, but there hasn't been a motion yet. There hasn't so. been a motion. Yeah. Okay. But instead, well, what I, what I wanted to ask was, is what I'd like to do is postpone the vote to next month so that we could see a plan uh, for what the rollout is going to look like, an implementation plan, and what the five year budget implications will be. I, I feel like that's what we've heard from many committee members here tonight that, um, and that I would feel much more comfortable voting at that time. So, so really, then your your motion is you're making a motion to basically postpone consideration of this item until the next meeting. Yes. Okay. That's, that's a motion. That's my. That's motion. fine. So you you want to postpone consideration. So yes. there's been a motion made. Is there a second on the motion? Um, second. Okay. So there's now a second. Um, so there's been a motion made and second. Is there any discussion on the motion? Does that impact? The city at all in terms of the dissemination of funds? If we Doesn't impact me. It would be more a question of procurement. It would be more a question for you know the administration. It doesn't affect us. It doesn't affect us. It's more. It would be more a timing issue in terms of when you want to, They want to make the procurement. Right. We typically do. Um, we typically accelerate the approval of school-related appropriations because we know that they have to start them earlier so that construction or whatever can happen over the summer. Right. Like if they're going to do the Ryan Road gymnasium floor, like they can't start that in June. They've got to like do all the bidding and everything early so it gets done. So it would be a question from a procurement standpoint whether that's going to, what that's going to do for Mr. Pagan, I don't know, and, and Ms. McLaughlin. Yeah. So uh, a delay on, on the on the Availability of the funding is going to delay the whole implementation. So something like this, uh, in terms of deployment of, har of hardware, we normally start it as soon as the money is available. So uh, we, if, if it's available in April, we start because the procurement takes weeks, the six to eight weeks for procurement. Uh, this time of device for this time of the year, it could be an, another eight weeks of delivery, uh, lead time. So we are talking that we will be receiving the equipment basically, I would say, mid-July, end of July. So the implementation deployment is that's that's the hardest time of the of the year for doing any hardware implementation because we are already preparing for starting the year, the school year. So it's, it's, it has some implications and uh, it might delay the whole implementation until the second semester of the of the of the school year. I would also like to point out that just for clarification when you're asking for rollout plans I mean there are a number of choices and I feel like that that is something that I can present choices certainly but I feel like that really is dependent upon what the school principals and administration feel is appropriate I feel like I would like to allow them to know what their building is looking for and what is appropriate for that so in you know I could say the same plans and proposals but if it's something that is dependent upon you all voting on the specific plan, I do feel like very strongly that that's something that the building principals should be able to have uh, a say on. Yeah, Ms. Voss? Um, a couple things. The reason I, one reason I support waiting a month is this has come up very quickly. We, it came up not really on the agenda, but part of the budget discussion last time. Today was put aside for the very first real discussion of it, the first public um, presentation of it. And I know there's people watching at home. I know there's people that would have had no idea that this was as big a discussion. And delaying it one month enables 
public input to the conversation. And I really feel like I could use some of that right now. Um, I think there's a really big range. And then the answer to the question there, I think for me, highlights why we need more time because how many Chromebooks are we ordering? And what is the need for them? And I don't think we've answered that. And I'm not feeling that I need to vote on every little last aspect of this, but I would like to understand what one-to-one -one means, how many Chromebooks we need to meet needs in our community, um, and what it's gonna cost. And, and I don't think you should order Chromebooks until that's been thought through, and if they're not ready for September, I'm really okay with that. I think that we don't need to rush this. Any other? Mr. Moore. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, some of this discussion is a little odd for me because it sounds almost as though we don't have any um, technology in the schools right now. And people are asking, so how do we, you know, what are we going to do with this? And it's like, well, we already have a lot of technology in the schools. And part of the, we have had a lot of these discussions. Um, and it's been, and many of these questions have sort of been answered with the technologies in the schools. When we, when we first started to put, you know, the carts <laughs> into into the schools, when we, which were was a big change because before that there were just, you know, some desktop computers in a computer lab. There were no no computers sort of in the classroom, and there and all of the I shouldn't say all I think all of the same questions were discussed and. You know, mostly having to do with would, would these d machines contribute to education, or would they um, either be unused, or just be a total waste of money, or would they be misused, which might be even worse <laughs> than if they were unused, um, and would it be, would they be actually a burden to teachers? You know, in terms of, you know, requiring teachers to develop skills that they didn't want or that <laughs> wouldn't be useful for them, you know, all those sorts of questions about use, and I, th and, 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 and I think for me, those questions have all been answered in a, in a pretty positive sort of way by the facts that we've had them now in the schools, and <laughs> rather than teachers uniformly rejecting them, <laughs> or. Or, or parents or students reporting, you know, that these machines were really, you know, like bad for them. That's not what we're getting. What we're getting is, you know, that yes, sometimes they are misused in the same way that um, my little brother, who's a cartoonist, used to pass his notebook around the classroom. Um, you know, it was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. It was a distraction. But, you know, we still had paper and pencil. And I think computers have maybe more potential for that, but they also maybe have more potential to be a, you know, a source of information for kids. So I mean, there's a you know, cost benefit. So, so, so I just look at this as sort of saying, for me, the, the, the discussion really is just the very narrow question really of um, how many computers, more computers, but I think as long as all those sort of questions about will they get used and will they get used you know, for education have kind of been answered over the last, I think when we first got those carts and things, maybe what, eight years ago or something, not that long ago. Um, and so, so that's the question of how many more. And, um, and I think that's an important, I think it's important, I think I know we need more because of all these questions about really making sure that all the kids, regardless of sort of their resources have uniform access because so much is so much is being asked of kids to, to use some sort of um, internet access in order to do schoolwork at home. You know, I just think that's incredibly important. And then the other one having to do with you know all the special ed uses. It's just um, <coughs> a huge thing and um, largely invisible unless you're one of those families, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think I'm, I'm convinced it needs to be more. And I agree, I don't know that we even know, and I don't know that we ever really could know the actual answer as to how many more, but I have two thoughts about that. For me right now, it's like, we're not actually 
this year buying the full cohort necessary to have as many computers as children between grades 3 and 12. I mean, that's not in the plan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -mm. And am I right about that? Mm -mm. Yeah, not for this year. This, this year, year we would not be buying enough computers to have that number. We're buying less than the number. We will, ha we will have a total of number of computers that's less than one to one. Okay. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. I think it's about one to one. Well, then what are we buying no, more not. for next year? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a two-year two phase. It's a two-year phase. In. Do you want? How to many are we buying this? Sh yeah. So, when we discuss this with, uh, with uh, advisory board or advisory committee, we talk about around 900 um, uh, Chrome. Now, why why we don't have a number today? First of all, I cannot I cannot make an estimate without knowing a number. So I did an estimate doing that. We are not buying only Chromebooks. We are also buying cards. We are also buying cases. We are also buying everything that is necessary to deploy. So this is something that we've been discussing for months with the principals, with, with the high school, with the middle school principals. We're still in the, in, the, in the process. And obviously, we are spending a lot of time on discussing something that we don't know whether we are going to get it or not. So this, this is something that it is not a fixed plan because we don't have the money approved. So it's, it's, we have a plan. We are talking about getting uh, middle school close to one to one and do the high school in two years because the high school is not ready yet because the teachers are not trained yet. So that's part of the plan. That has been discussed. I've been discussed with the uh, uh, teacher leads on, on, on the high school with the, all the principals there and the associate principals. And uh, it's been discussed with uh, the superintendent on a weekly basis. We've been talking about this for months and with Candy. So all that information is there. I think that as administrators, we have to do that. I don't think that we have to discuss it to the point because we don't have a plan set up because we are still working on it. It's a, it's a work. Let me, let me tell you something. Windows machines, we don't know how many Windows machines we are going to buy until June because we don't know how much money we are going to have available. So I cannot have a plan in, in February to tell you how many computers I'm going to buy. It's, it's impossible because it, I, the, the Windows machines purchase is not sustainable. It's, it hasn't been sustainable in the last 12 years. There's no money to replace, as, as you mentioned, we got computers here for seven years old, eight years old, because we don't have the money to do it. But it costs four times more to buy a Windows machine than to buy a Chromebook. So that means it takes more time for me to replace those, and I've been only one year here. And let me tell you, I have worked with hundreds of, of school districts because I have provided services as a provider before. So I, I know how difficult is the budget for districts. But, it is, you know, we cannot stop developing things and deploying things because a plan is not being set. If, it, if that was the case, IBM was not that as big as, big as it is today. Microsoft was not as big as it is today. You cannot stop progressing because there is not a fixed number in front of you. You have to make decisions sometimes even when you don't have the numbers. And I, as I mentioned before, I've been doing this for so many years. And let me tell you, nobody budgets for technology, not even corporates. Corporations don't budget for technology as needed because it's unknown. It's, it's, it's one of the fields and it's one of the, uh, the areas of any business that you don't know how much you need until the time comes. It is really hard, and that's <coughs> what I mentioned before. Making projections of four years in technology is laughable, really, because you don't know exactly what is going to happen two years from now. So you can project as much as you put you can as an expert, but you have to refine that every few months. It's, it's a hard thing and to hear, I, and I'm sorry I'm a little agitated because it, it's very hard to hear that we have to have all these details before we move on when we don't know if we will be able to do it or not. There is, there is a lot of expenses that go with technology. We, we spend $384,000 every year on technology without counting the salary and it's not enough for the technology that takes to run a district like this. If we had the money, I would be asking uh, the superintendent and Candy for half a million dollars every year. And I think it would not be enough if we want to keep it the way it is. I'm not sure if, if, if we are aware of something. Massachusetts is, is the least state in innovation. 
every in, in this region only, and Western Mass is not a technology hub, as as you know. <laughs> every every two jobs, every 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 yeah, every two jobs that are open with any skills, not only technology skills, but any mid skills, have only one kid that is coming out of college with the skills. That is today. So that means we are not preparing kids with the right skills. We are not. Not even, I'm not talking about high school, I'm talking the, the colleges. And as you mentioned before, as a, as a technology manager, I have had so many kids coming out of college that have no idea of what technology to use. And not as technology uh, uh, employees, as an employee that needs to sit down in front of a computer and use an ERP system or use a CRM system or use just a software system. It's, it's really uh, difficult. We are, as, you know, as a country, I would say, we are behind on providing the, the students the skills necessary for the work that is available today, and I'm not talking about the ones that are going to be available in five years. So it's, it's definitely um, a big need for, for that. Do you have a question? Yeah, it just, it's related to this, I think, and just following up on Mr. Moore's comments. So my understanding of the numbers we have is that we, in the district, there's roughly, there's a little more, 1,300 Chromebooks, and the proposal was roughly 700 more, and it adds up to roughly one-to-one -one <coughs> if you add those together. And um, so I think that's a lot. I think it's a big jump. Um, what I've tried in different ways to ask is, is it possible to say, let's just consider JFK. We've heard there are not enough Chromebooks in the cart to JFK for the teachers. We also know that kids are at band or at PE or at art or at music different parts of the day. So the question is, how many more carts and Chromebooks are needed to fulfill the teacher's use? And um, I don't think, this is where I, as I said at the beginning, I'm still hung up because I don't think you need exactly one-to-one -one but you can spend money and have it more sustainable. You yourself are standing there saying we can't afford this. So how many do we need to find that balance between serving all the kids, letting enough of them take, the ones that need it take it home, but not necessarily get all the way to the 2,000? And, and if we have fewer, it's cheaper to replace them every year. I, I agree with that. I think that, that we should look closer to the numbers as we get closer to the deployment. I think that- uh, But you're about to order them. No, we are not going to order them until we have the number. What I'm saying is, I need to sit down with the principal and say, okay, what is the enrollment for next year? How do you want to really implement this? And this, is, this conversation has started, but we haven't finished them. So what are the, the numbers that you want on every grade? Because now we go to the grade level. So how many you need in the, in, because we need spares also. We, we, ca we cannot run on specific numbers. We have to have enough for teachers. As uh, somebody mentioned here, teachers have to have Chromebooks. So you have to add the Chromebooks for teachers also because they, they need to be able to get those, those computers with them in order to, to know how to teach with them. So I would say the number on, on, on the middle school is around between 550 and, and 600. That, that is the number that we have guesstimate there. We are going to be close to that. I'm not going to order, and, and let me tell you, I buy, okay, so we buy, for example, switches. So we have a number of switches that we have to replace every, every year, okay? We get the money on the budget. And most likely, when it comes to the time of ordering, if I uh, request 45,000, maybe I need only 35. I don't spend the 45,000. I spend the 35, and those $10,000 can be used for something else. But I need to ask for 45,000 because that's the best estimate that I had at the time of asking for the budget. Because normally it's about 12 to 18 months before you get the money available. So that is something that happens all the time in technology. You ask for a certain amount based on the estimate, but when you go to do the purchase order, you adjust to the real need. And that's how I do it. That's how we, we've been doing it since or since I remember. That's what all departments do, right? Yeah. So um, I just want to remind people we have a motion on the table to postpone this, but we all seem to be not wanting to postpone it because we're continuing to talk about it. So I don't want, there's a, as a parliamentary issue, there's a motion to postpone this, but then everybody's continuing to discuss the substance of it. So 
Um, I guess I'd like just to take the vote on the postponement, and then we can get back to the main menu, uh, the main issue of of talking about it. Um, unless, of course, the motion to postpone it passes, and then we can move on to other things. So, so can I just add one more thing on the subject of the motion since I? Sure. Oh, sorry. sure. Go ahead. Well, okay. Go ahead. Well, I just want to know, no. Ms. Fallon, is it just is your is it about? It, or not no, it, well, I mean, it was related to that. I okay. I understand the the desire to have absolutes, but even when we talk about budgeting for five years, in some ways, that's also laughable because we never have any idea how much the federal government's going to give us, how much the state government's going to give us, what they'll take in my way mid year. So, while it would be really awesome to be able to plan everything out to the penny. It, long term, we can't do that. And in the same way, I guess I feel about this, like. When we look at the numbers of computers that are in the building, I, I, I don't, th my daughter today, I said, how is school? And she said, oh, you know, we were doing this project. They had to get a, one computer from each classroom surrounding them. They all sat down, so then they had less time to do their project. And she said, I pulled the worst straw. Mine was the one missing the backspace key. N most of the computers in the room were missing keys, but the kid who was missing the X just found a way around it. She was missing the backspace key, and she was like, you know me, like that was a problem. And so while we may have a certain number of, of computers in the building right now, ideally some of them will be replaced as soon as we get them. And so I feel like that's part of the problem with trying to pin down a number is you know, yeah, we could keep using the ones that are missing keys, but if we get money, let's try and replace those so these kids aren't already anxious taking a test trying to figure out the way around keys. So I, I don't feel the need to postpone it in that way because I don't think it's going to clarify the budget for me because I don't think we can, and I don't think that the number of, of computers is going to be pinpointed more clearly by waiting a month. Ms. Busansky. Um the maker of this motion right well I guess I just I just wanted to add that I think we do um, pr projections all the time you do them when you give us the sort of state of the city you do that when we look at the first few budget we do it in the budget book I, I do it in my own day my day job is all about you know three to five year projections and of course we know that the world changes and things change and all things but we do projections all the time because we have to because that's proper planning that's that's what we do right and then things change so I feel like projections to have a five-year projections on this is just not unreasonable I think my read on the committee and my own feeling on this is that we want to approve this money so to me the big question what postponing for a month does for us is it just gives us I, it lets us know what we are I, I just don't as great and thoughtful as the presentation was I think it was just missing what are we actually proposing doing what's the number what's that what's it going to look like on a day-to-day -day basis what is the difference between more and a one-to-one -one laptop program and if we could go with more and meet teachers needs and we could save money maybe we could do the whole 3 to 12 program with just the fiscal year 19 money or maybe we just need less we could request less from the city in fiscal year 20 and maybe we'd want to propose some other capital improvement project with that money that's you know still remaining we bought our math investigations textbook textbooks with capital improvement money maybe we need other textbooks maybe we need other books the women's history class this year had no money for that was books. a one-time non-precedent setting uh, okay anyway there could be other projects that's my point so that's all I'm asking for by delaying the vote for a, a month is to just get more information but okay so all those in favor of the motion to postpone please say aye uh, aye those opposed please say no 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 um sounds like the no's have it but I'm gonna ask for a roll call because I couldn't quite hear aye no Aye. No. Uh, no. Yes. No. No. Okay, so the motion fails. We're back to the main motion. Mr. Zahowski said no. <laughs> <laughs> you were late. I don't know. She wrote you off. That's correct. So do you want to make a motion? And so then I would make a motion, putting on my glasses, um, where are we? 
I would make a motion um, to keep the capital improvement funds from the city to purchase Chromebooks. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of that motion? Okay. Is there a chance for short discussion? Uh, after it's been seconded? Sure. Okay. I really liked the motion, but I want to make sure it's what you think it is. So you just said use the money to purchase Chromebooks. I want to just say yes, that's fine. What I didn't hear in your motion, but I thought was on our agenda, was one-to-one -one Chromebooks. So just please clarify what we're voting on. And I, I would, this would, for me, it would feel really good to just have the motion be use the money for Chromebooks and not put that other word that we have been unable to define in there. Yeah. Um. Does it say one-to-one? -one? Oh, it doesn't say one-to-one. -one. I believe, I, the, I that's believe it's purchased consistent with the appropriation, the requested appropriation from the city council. So yeah. I, I, would, I would, for reference, I would consult the, the capital plan that was submitted by the mayor, the five-year capital plan. Yeah. That's what the, that's mm -hmm. what the, mm -hmm. I mean, the money is not appropriated by the mayor, so it's up to the council, mm -hmm. and the council is going to look at the capital plan. Mm -hmm. and that's why I'm trying to clarify what. Well, I submitted an order that said the name of the project, which I believe was one to one Chromebooks, was the name of the pro mm -hmm. multi year project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what the funding is for. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what the, that's what the actual lawful appropriation is. Yeah. If it's helpful, I would point out that the money, the amount of money on the table is insufficient to achieve one-to-one, -one, so yeah. Yeah. maybe kind of moot. Exactly. So I don't think there's any <laughs> often distinction things on roof difference. repair projects when we know that it will only repair part of the roof mm -hmm. and it doesn't. So yeah. No, we don't usually get to this level of specificity <laughs> in our capital projects, but so, <laughs> yes. Just really quick clarification. This might be a clarification for Antonio and Molly. The money that's being approved right now for fiscal year 19 for next school year would not be sufficient money for every, for example, NHS student to carry home their own Chromebook. That is okay. Yeah. Okay. Just I just to, needed to 100% confirm. And, and, and the school department is not obligated to spend. No, not at all. Dollar. <laughs> no, so, right? so, yeah. right. so again, you know, from in the budgeting perspective, right. You ask right. for enough, but I'm I'm pretty confident that our IT staff is not just going to spend it on additional expensive stuff mm -hmm. if the, if it doesn't support the program. Mm -hmm. But I think if you don't have a ceiling, then you can't build underneath it. So this is the the specification. I mean, I I don't even want to get into how you can't really know what the price is until you've talked with the vendor about how much stuff you're actually going to buy. So, you know, we don't even want to get into unit costs of, oh, well, if we roll this out more slowly, then our unit cost changes. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's why I feel like it's part of this budget process. But again, if, if, if they decide in consulting with building, you know, building leaders and teachers that they'll do less, there's nothing to obligate them to spend all of this money or for the district to continue in this direction for the next fiscal year. So this is only talking about potentially what could be spent from the 19 appropriation. So there's been a motion, well, there was a clarification on your motion, but I think you're reading the motion that's on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Correct. Has it been seconded? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, just making sure. Yes, Mr. Moore. Um, I just also want to make the observation. I think this has been a really great discussion. It's been going on now for a month. Um, and, I, and as I said before, it's, it's actually a continuation of a discussion that's happened on previous occasions and I have a lot of confidence actually that our administrators and teachers um, have been paying attention to this discuss discussion and will um, incorporate you know those concerns into their um, into the way they use this money um, you know that this is not that this discussion is is actually um, meaningful and um, and it will be given more meaning by the, by the people who are spending the money. So I, uh, and I trust that that will happen. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. Any abstentions? Okay. So the motion carries.
Um, the next item on the agenda is a vote on a job description for a school psychologist. Uh, Dr. Provost, do you want to explain that? Actually, the, the next item is the MOA. Oh. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, vote to okay. authorize superintendent to draft an MOA on therapy assistant for summer pay. Sorry about that. It's okay. This request goes back to the negotiations on the current collective bargaining agreement. At one of the sessions, there was a request made from the special education director for a rate of pay for uh, CODAs, certified occupied therapy assistants, and physical therapy assistants. At the time, the amount submitted was $15, and that $15 an hour, and that was the amount that was um, later incorporated into the agreement. Um, as I'll remem remind the public, I'm not a negotiator, but I remember sitting at that and thinking that it was very unreasonable that we'd be able to find someone with those qualifications for $15 an hour, but that was the information from the, the special ed director, and so that's what was uh, approved. We do pay um, speech therapy assistance $35 an hour in the summer program. I think that these types of therapy assistants are similarly situated individuals, and so um, both from a, the practical perspective of trying to find individuals and from the equity perspective of treating similarly situated individuals similarly, I would uh, request your permission to work with our attorney to draft an MOA that extends the $35 an hour rate to our physical therapy assistants and occupational therapy assistants. Okay. Make Move a motion to authorize the suit. Oh. Are you gonna, no, no go for it. Paper you phone. Know. <laughs> oh, I know you go ahead. Please. You're the you're vice chair. <laughs> I authorize the superintendent to draft an MOA on therapy assistant summer pay. Second. Okay. Any um, discussion of this? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now on to the uh, school psychologist job description. As part of our last budget discussion, we talked about the modern role of school psychologists, and this job description has been updated to, um, to reflect that. Um, just a few things that I would draw your attention to in the job description. The fourth bullet point, facilitating response to intervention screening and the intervention process. Obviously, that was something that we weren't even doing in the district until three years ago. That's um, a, a different type of role than traditional psychometrician. Conducting functional behavioral assessments, which is a type of assessment, but it's a much different kind of assessment than giving a whisk. Um, it really requires psychologists to be involved in the classroom, observing interactions between students and staff, and then consulting with staff on um, behavioral interventions for students. That's two bullet points down. The next one, um, consulting with the school's designated mental health team. Um, as social emotional issues have become more a part of the landscape for students, every one of our schools has developed a mental health team and the school psychologist is an integral part of that and pr provides a very unique perspective on student needs. Um, and then just the next two bullet points, providing professional development to colleagues, um, completely different from the days when psychologists were just giving testing it was really impossible for them to give professional development because no one else was trained to give the tests or qualified to give the tests. And then um, consulting with community agencies regarding, regarding collaborative supports. For many of our students, we're trying to build wraparound supports to the extent possible, and many times the school psychologist is a linchpin in those, those, that planning. And so those are all um, things that you may not think of um, when you think of a school psychologist. So we wanted to add those to this, the job description to accurately reflect the work they're doing. Okay. Um, can we have a motion first, and then, we'll, then we can have a discussion? Sahowski? Mr. Meyer, just want, just want to no, he's, no, he's, he's reading. reading. Okay. I make a motion on the job description for the school psychologist. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. Mr. Kaufman? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Plummer, thank you so much for leading this revision of the school psychologist position. I, it's wonderful. It's just so consistent with what you've presented last meeting and <coughs> you too as well, Dr. Provost. So I think this is definitely the position to move the way to move towards this. And all other job descriptions as they come up, the more we can look at. <coughs> 
um, our commitment to uh, wins, our commitment to uh, social justice, whatever, we should tweak these things as they go along. So thank you for doing this. One real quick question. I noticed just looking at job descriptions myself over the last couple of years that um, there's a lot of job descriptions that go into like approximate time that will be devoted to certain tasks. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that would be advantageous for us to consider either for this or in the future um, to really make it crystal clear to an applicant especially a school psych applicant who might just again naturally think that this is going to be about testing that we're very serious about other responsibilities and we've actually just said approximate I know we can't make that commitment but my sense in reading other job descriptions you get a you, you get an idea about how much time I'll actually be doing and how much time they expect of me it helps it helps a lot I just want to throw that out there as an option either for this or for you to work with HR and thinking about whether you thought that was a good idea or not I will consult with HR on that. Um, the, their general um, philosophy, I think, is to be less prescriptive rather than more, but yeah. I will I'll run that by our director. Right. Do you see the advantage I'm talking about, particularly for something like this? I don't know if you would agree with me that because the, the, the distinct nodding your head. Yeah. This is just a first read. Just because so many people graduate and think I'm going to get stuck doing this. We want to make this as attractive as possible, as much as everything else that we're changing towards and our commitment to the things that we're committed to us. I want to make this as attractive <coughs> as possible to the best candidates. But overall, really nice. Thank you. Ms. Plummer? Sure. Come to, the, come to the podium. Since we've hired a few school psychologists over the last few years, we've already, we, we use that not just, um, well, certainly we haven't used it necessarily in the advertising. Yeah. Um, but during our interview questions, sure. that is absolutely um, a real obvious uh, part right. of it. Um, so I think, and the job description isn't very, it's, it's really not anything different from what people are already doing, certainly at the elementary level. Um, it just it articulates it um, in a way that it wasn't. It's, I think it's different than what a lot of school psychologists are doing in other districts, and it's some of other, them yeah. are fantastic. I, I understand what you're saying, but this would be a, just a third dimension of attracting yeah. outside candidates that don't know the change we made. I just, just get an email from the um, Massachusetts School Psych Association posting a position from a small town yeah. in like Central Mass that described it in a very similar way. So there are other districts but, now, and they're trying. You can tell. I, I just got a random email because <laughs> I'm a school psychologist. Um, but yeah, I think we have to think about how to get the word out. So, Thank you. you're, not, you're not leaving, right? That's, that's <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> no, any head, head killing you, you know. I was thinking. Okay. Um, so, any other questions about the job description? Okay. So, all those in favor of approving the school psychologist uh, job description, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So now we have a series of gifts. Um, the first is a vote um, on a gift of the NHS Theater uh, 2000, Friends of the NHS Theater, $2,000 to the NHS Theater. Ms. Walzik? Yes, the Friends of the NHS Theater is a new group that's come together probably like in the past year, essentially a booster club for the theater programs. And they made a commitment to make a donation to help underwrite the costs of the METG, the Mass Educational Theater Guild competition that was just done at the high school. So they're donating $2,000 to help fund the cost that we had of putting that production together. Make a motion to accept the gift friends of NHS Theater in the amount of $2,000 to NHS Theater. Second. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion of this? <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. The next item on the agenda is a gift uh, local vocal cord bowl estimated at $2,000 to the music programs. Yeah, the local vocal chord bowl was held this past Saturday. Our own Dr. Plummer participated in it. Um, <laughs> and this is, this is the uh, third year that the group has come to us and has offered to donate 50% of the proceeds after they cover all their expenses to us, and the other 50%, I believe, is going to the Amherst schools, which is what they've done before. So they, based on history, are estimating $2,000. In the past, we've actually seen the donation be a little bit higher. Um, purely dependent on how many people showed up and how many donations they had to underwrite their production. So we should get that check within the next month or so. Okay. Um, and thank them for their third year of donating. Motion to accept the gift of local vocal cord bowl estimated amount of $2,000 to the music programs. Second. Okay. Motion's been <coughs> made and seconded. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that carries. Uh, next is a gift from the Northampton Athletic Booster Club, uh, three portable scoreboards for NHS athletics. 
Yeah, these are wireless portable scoreboards that'll be used for softball, baseball, lacrosse, soccer, and football. They'll be moved as needed. They can either be placed on the ground or temporarily mounted um, by the grounds crew working with the athletic department. So they're um, really looking forward to having these on the back fields where they don't have that main scoreboard. Make a motion to accept the gift at the NABC three portable scoreboards for NHS athletics. Second. Okay. Motion's been seconded. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that completes the gift portion of the agenda. Uh, now we move into reports, and we've got a rules and policy subcommittee. But okay. Ms. Fallon has left. So uh, has excused herself. Okay. Um, we, I think the first one is the advanced placement exam fee reductions policy, I-K-A-A-P. Um, the highlights. I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing, but the, the, the highlight really is what we, we're trying to cautiously enter into the world of increasing the subsidy for um, AP exams. We, we don't really know how much it will cost to do so. Um, what we currently do is free and reduced lunch, and we're leaving that as is, and you can see what it is, the zero for students who receive a free lunch, $15 per exam for students who receive a reduced lunch and then what we are adding essentially is for students who are at above the reduced lunch which is 185 percent of the household poverty level we're adding between 185 percent and 200 percent of the household poverty level as getting a $15 fee for the exam so a reduced fee for that and then what that does is that means we have to add an income determination for those people between 185 and 200%. And the document that we will use is the tax return transcript from the IRS. Um, I'm going to be offering an amendment <laughs> to this which will state that <coughs> students who are taking AP classes will be provided with information on obtaining the transcript. So it, it will not just simply be an <laughs> inscrutable thing. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and that's essentially it, I think. Okay. So this is a first reading item. Are there any questions about this on first reading? And I, oh, sorry. Uh, Elena, and then we'll go to Dr. Provost. I would just add to your amendment, I don't know if this needs to be included in the actual policy, but um, as a student who recently attempted to apply for financial aid for AP tests, um, wasn't on this policy, but I can just imagine myself seeing 185 to 200%, and I attempted to go online and search up and figure out whether or not my income qualified in those, and it was really confusing. Um, so I know that those percentages change year to year, so we yes. can't include the actual income in there, but maybe including for students, not necessarily in the policy, but a link to some sort of like Massachusetts website that they could get that information on, or the fuel assistance site, or mm -hmm. some way that a student could easily figure out whether they should even bother trying to find their federal tax. Yeah, this is some, that's something that guidance should do. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add that into the conversation. And maybe that is, maybe that gets added to the amendment. <laughs> um, the students will be providing information on HHS household poverty levels and, uh, and, right. um, and on... Because I think a student should know whether or not they should bother finding their yes, tax absolutely. before they go through that process. Right. Dr. Provost? I have a feeling that Mr. Moore wants to introduce a second amendment to change the word alternately to alternatively. Yes, I do. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, we will, uh, so, so is this actually on the table? No, it's not. It's a first reason. So, 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 so no, there won't be any amendment tonight. But, so but next time, alternate amendments. It will be turned to alternatively if we vote okay. the right way. Okay. Yes. Can I just, um, it's such a great question. I totally understand that thing of like, where do I fit in the financial area? Does that go into, I mean, as members of the community that have worked on that, would that go into a rules and policy or does that, how do, how is that well, done? Well, that's why I said that I don't think it necessarily well, needs to be included. Right, in right. I was just curious yeah. if we need to be thinking of that in the next reading. Mm -hmm. so just to clear, this may, I mean. Just to clarify, yeah. the transcript tool is online and you just feed in your social. So there's no finding of a tax return. I mean, you just go to irs.gov and so it just spits out your transcript. It's a, you can print it as a PDF. 
So I would, right, I would like, want, I want there to be guidance around this, but it would, it takes you about 30 seconds right, to but do. But like, it. as a student, right? Like, you know, say my parents aren't home and my social security number isn't the one that's oh, no, going to no, be on the tax return. Like, it's, it's a whole. Just, I want there to make sure that, and I'm sure Mr. Lombardi will take care of this, but making sure that we're encouraging infrastructure at the high school so that a student who would qualify for this has the ease of access right. to be able to figure that out. I would think the easiest thing would, to do would just be to set a number that would be at more than 225 percent and say submit, right? Because you wouldn't know, you wouldn't, you don't. And that's the other, the other amendment I was going to, or the other suggestion I was going to make is what, what year of the transcript? Mm -hmm. Because you might pass over the threshold or drop below the threshold. So because based on because you're, yeah, you're taking the class in the fall. You're taking the class in the fall. So you're on that that year's tax return, but, but by the but by the end of the year, we also talked about people who <laughs> get extensions. I know, but by the end of the year, you might be on the next year's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. So we should specify. So any other questions about this? It sounds like we've got a lot of um, suggestions for amendments for the next meeting for the next reading. Yes, Ms. Bisansky. So if if I'm understanding this correctly, we really just need to understand who falls into that or a, a student would need to know if they fall into that 185 to 200 percent band there right do we have any other experience with this how um is this a you know a deterrent in any way having the you know jump that through that extra hurdle of getting your federal tax return transcript okay so or not i just so it's easy to get the transcript but mm -hmm. we have no experience because all of our all of our existing sort of formalized subsidies are for free and reduced lunch. That's been our only thing. So this is a, this is a new <coughs> foray into a new world mm -hmm. um, in terms of that. So no, we don't have any experience with that. Um, and at least it would be, regardless of the hurdles, previously there, there was an absolute bar. There was no subsidy. Mm -hmm. So this is better, but mm -hmm. we don't know how big of a hurdle it will be. Right. I guess information will be key. Yeah. Yeah. But we do know, even with reduced and free lunch, that it's sometimes very right. difficult to get families to apply for that, and that, that's why right. we have reporting from other agencies to make us aware. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think that we could probably imagine that for an even smaller benefit than reduced and free provides to a family, that it, we're going to have to do a lot of work to make, make sure the students can avail themselves. Dr. Provost. And this policy intentionally creates another avenue for individuals to disclose their eligibility status because sometimes <coughs> individuals who are eligible for free and reduced lunch status will refuse to release that. So um, this allows them not to formally enroll in a free and reduced lunch program but still establish eligibility by getting the transcript. Alternatively. Yes. <laughs> Alternatively. Okay, uh, what's the next policy that we're And then the next policy is student fees, fines, and charges. And uh, we are, <laughs> the, the, the proposed amendments are um, largely to try to get it sort of just cleaned up. Um, we sort of change, essentially getting, it, so it's just fees, fines, and um, and, well, you can read what these amendments are, but it's essentially just cleaning it up because it was getting, it was a pretty confusing policy before this. Okay. Any questions? There also, there also was another um, reason for addressing this policy, which was we had received from some guidance from MASC that we should have a policy that obligates us to provide notice to students of what the fees and fines they may face will be. So placing this in the student handbook. Okay. Any other, uh, anything else from rules and policy? And that's it. Okay. So now we'll move on to a report of the budget. And oh, I will just briefly say we had a really long and uh, detailed discussion at our last meeting of two policies which have been here before and which will no doubt be coming to you again. Really thinking through the basis for um, our naming policy of naming of facilities and areas on the district and we're, and and um, so any thoughts you might have feel free to send them in and if you have any constituents who have thoughts on that send them in um, 
we're really looking on terms of taking the long view, like 100 years from now, what will the district be like, <laughs> depending on this policy? And um, what was that other one we spent so much time on? Public complaints. Public complaints. And we're realizing that um, there is really kind of two kinds of public complaints we're talking about. We're talking about complaints from the public and publicly made complaints. And <laughs> which are very different and you might have to have separate policies. So again, lend your, lend your mind to thinking about that for a little bit. And, um, and likewise, feel free to give us input. Is that a policy or a Zen koan? <laughs> okay, now we're in on. word order. Moving on to the Budget and Property Subcommittee. Mr. Meyer, you have a report? Uh, oh. Yes. So um, we discussed a proposal to place an electric bike share station in front of uh, Northampton High School. Um, I would recommend that you go to the Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission's website and type bike share into the search bar and you will get a beautiful document that will describe how this is going to be rolled out regionally. Um, the impact or, uh, on Northampton Public Schools and the benefit would be uh, I think it's about a 6 by 40 foot concrete pad that would be placed um, in front of Northampton High School along the sidewalk. Um, and so what we did as a committee was to authorize the superintendent into negotiations with the city about how, how the lease or license or transfer or surplusage will happen. Um, when the superintendent has that, he will bring it back to us. The next thing was just an information item. We discussed about placing solar panels on school roofs. Um, it, we, of course, found out that we are so green that we already make more electricity than we consume from the city solar installations. So they would not be interested in buying any power from us. Um, and so the question was, um, would we be in a, a position to have a private vendor site panels on our roofs and pay us some money that could be then used for school programs? Um, of course, the impact on your roof and not wanting to have a net cost came up and so that was something that we the department was going to continue to investigate and bring us back information as they develop it um, and the last is an item that we have a vote on which is the um, clark school lease is up for renewal um, this is for a one-year extension and so we authorize the superintendent to enter into negotiations and i believe he is bringing us back the result of those negotiations it says there is a rate for Clark School lease at Leeds. Yes. As a condition of your, as part of your report. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's the next item in your packet. Um, you'll see uh, a memorandum from Candy Walzak dated April 9th, um, basically discussing that our recommendation was for a 5% increase in the rental rate. It would be an overall annual increase to Clark of $1,074.60. Um, at your, I don't, at your tables when you came in, there was a letter from Clark accepting those terms, and so I'm recommending that we exercise the second of the three one-year extension options with a 5% increase in the rental fee. Someone would like to say so moved. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay. Excellent. So, um, so the motion then is to uh, to approve the the lease rate as described by the superintendent. Any questions? All those in. Oh. Yeah, I did notice in the letter that they they apparently don't feel, or maybe they would, maybe they don't not feel, but they would like to have it acknowledged the um, the in kind um, inventory of books, gym equipment, furniture, and various other materials, which was made several years ago when they first moved to Leeds, mm -hmm. and so I think. I think I just did that. <laughs> okay. So we'll make sure that that's noted for the record. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay. So that uh, rate is approved for the lease extension. Um, next, we have a discussion and vote uh, UMass bus optimization study. I'll turn this over to Ms. Voss. Okay. So I, um, I asked Dr. Provost if I could at least tell you about this, and it's turned into a vote, which is totally fine and great. Um, but just to give a quick background, um, I'm an MIT alum. I was reading something in January about a really neat optimization study some students had done there where 
Boston had put out this bid to make their bus system more optimal, and it saved a lot of money. It looked super interesting, and I, it got me thinking about our bus system and all the problems we've had with it, Mr. Meyer, in terms of what time we start our schools. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went and talked to Dr. Provost and um, Joy Winnie, and we had a good chat, and I made some maps, and I thought about it a bit more, and I asked him, and, and I'm happy to share since it's late, I'm sure you don't want too many details. Um, some ideas where I felt like we could, this was also at the time of the bus contract, and I'm really worried about us at the time and continue the price of busing, um, the cost to families, it going up. Um, in the ideal world, I would love us to, to see us have a late bus at both the middle and the high school. So this kind of all just came together under one umbrella. And we talked, and at the end of our conversation, Dr. Provost, um, and I agreed I could reach out um, to get more information. And instead of going to the group at MIT, to go to a group in um, transportation engineering at UMass. So I made contact with Professor Eric Gonzalez. I've been over to meet with him, showed him some of the ideas, um, whatever level of detail you want, I'm happy to share it. Um, and where it stands now, it's slightly changed. Um, he is really excited about it, and if we want to go ahead and see if he can help optimize this using technology and computer programming. Um, he has a master student looking for a project, and it would be the project of the student. When I first talked to him, he had a, a graduate level class that he has community projects in, and it was going to be there, and that's, I think, what something I read today implied. But that class has been canceled in the fall, and he wrote and said, well, the good news is the student could actually start sooner. Um, it would be free. Um, we wouldn't be paying for it. Um, and I said I'd be happy to be the intermediate. This is not my area. I know something about optimizing, but not at all my area. Um, my initial ideas, and I do want to put this out there, of a way to potentially save time and money and such um, would require busing the high school and the middle school students together. And just you have to start an optimization process somewhere, so giving him some parameters, which People can say, just do it, don't do it at all, have a subcommittee, have you know, input. I don't know what that looks like moving forward. But my original idea and what he and I talked about would be the, an idea that the high school and the middle school would start at the same time. And I think there's some real optimization in having buses go back and forth between them in a, in a hub-like way. And I'll leave it at that. So I think if you want me to move forward with this, that is where the conversation is right now. Okay. Any questions or comments? Um, I would note that the MIT study almost got the uh, superintendent of the Boston Public Schools fired. I and uh, I know. That's but that was. But, yeah. but I think. <laughs> but, but, I, but, I, but I think it was more complicated because there was also a late. Uh, there was a start time change. Well, yeah, it was a start. It was time much change. more yeah, complicated. I'm just saying that the. And they, and I'm not actually. Yeah. I. I genuinely saying to you all, if you say, we have too much going on right now, there's, this is not the time for this, I am so busy, I, my feelings will not be hurt, and I will genuinely say my motivation was saving money, worrying about the bus contract, and thinking about a late bus for all those kids who don't get to take advantage of the great program we, we have at the schools. So at the same time, I agree, it's, this is, it, it's time. Um, so I, I was very excited to see this because it is one thing I have regretted is that that initiative that started a decade ago has gone nowhere, and I think it's unfortunate. Um, I Actually, in the paper today, the 10 years yeah. ago today yeah. is about the late start yeah. uh, thing in the 10 years. Well, and, and I should add that, too, right? Yeah. And, and when I originally talked to him, I threw the number out, start at 830, yeah. so you'll be happy to yeah, hear. And I would and I would never turn down free help. Um, and and I would only I would only note though that that busing middle and high school kids was there were some members of the committee at the time that we last considered who were not elementary. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I think even even oh, even yeah. even I, even having a, a sixth a grader <laughs> with a high school senior <laughs> was considered problematic by members of the committee at that time. So I mean I, I have no idea, but I would I would not say stop because of that. I might say, let's go forward and see what we get. Didn't we also pay somebody to look at the hub? Yes, we did. First models? Chance. First chance. Yes, we did. First we paid ten thousand yeah. dollars. Oh, Dr. Provost. I think that another part of having this discussion was also to get other parameters, um, you know, the limits that they have to work with. 
Uh, two of the things that I've suggested are they can't come up with any of the eight solutions that have already been proposed <laughs> <laughs> and that it can't add to the cost of transportation. But if there are others, it would be helpful for them to know that so they don't produce a plan that just dies on arrival. Right. I, when I was looking at these things, I think my impression was that the, actually whether or not it's a later start time, that, that start times and transportation are very tightly linked. But um, and so you can't, you can almost not talk about optimizing transportation without allowing um, changes in start time because otherwise it's not possible. And then the other thing, which is perhaps more controversial than start times, is um, school districts. Um, so because because it's, it's pretty obvious if you look at our bus routes right now that the, uh, one of the big inefficiencies at the elementary level has to do with where the children are coming from. And so, so I think that's another decision you have to make. I think you have to, if you can ask somebody to optimize transportation, you can do optimize transportation, and which might make some sense because it is a big dollar item in our budget. Um, but then that would mean if they're really just going to do that without any other, you know, mission, then the, this redistricting schools could, would happen <laughs> as well as start times for all the schools would happen. And you know, as you made that your only criteria was what's the most efficient transportation. Right. And so I think that's, you, you, you have to know that if you're asking just to optimize transportation, um, then these other things will be will get moved in order to serve that, and and I don't, I don't know if that's something that we even want to bother asking for if we don't think we have the stomach to um, deal with. So so just so you know, I told them the community cared very much about starting more like eight thirty. I cared very much about the fact that I think I looked at all the reports. Mm -hmm. The buses aren't really filled. Yeah. There's a lot of empty buses driving around, and so. Big picture starting point for my discussion was, and I asked Dr. Povis before I started any of this, could I think about high school and middle schoolers on the same bus? And I actually researched this, and the way communities do this is they put, say, the middle schoolers in the front half and the high schoolers in the back half. You know, that's one way they've handled it. And that is something our community needs to let us know. But if we did that, the idea and the reason it would be different from what was done before is if you started JFK and the middle school, uh, sorry, JFK and the high school at the same time and used some of the same bus routes for when you go out west in Northampton and have these buses that aren't filled that require a lot of driving around and you got those kids that were toward JFK, all the JFK just past eight and all the kids the other direction, Northampton to the high school, then those same buses can be used to go back and forth between the high school and JFK. And so that's, if you simplify it and start those two schools and, um, you know, if you listen to what they say about the sleep, it's the middle school kids too that need yeah. this. So it's, you know, it, it kind of solves, graders. they, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to debate that and I, you know you don't <laughs> want me to debate that, but if we're trying to late, make the start time later from 7th to 12th grade, there's a, or 6th to 12th grade, there's a lot of reason to, to lump that group together. And the real, as you know, because you've thought about it more than me, the real problem is at the pickup day, because elementary school day is shorter. And I can't promise this is going to work, but the other thing this group can throw at it is optimization tools. And you can go back and put, once you have the GIS stuff in their software, if the districts change, I think they can just redo it like that. And the questions the community would need to answer are more things like, do we care more about how much time the kids spend on the bus versus how far they walk to the bus stop? So like, those are kind of conversations that we will need to give them answers to. But if you, you know, start with that model I just proposed, I'm, I, it might be interesting to see where it goes. It might not be. I don't know what people want. Well, and I was curious what would be the um, impact on the school transportation? Like how much time would she need to devote to this in terms of giving them all the data? Or is it going to be constant? She's going to need to... She doesn't want to, and I think I have most of it. Okay. Yeah, I think in the research that's been done for the previous plans, there's a lot of, a lot data. of data. Okay. There's ridership data. There's the routes. Okay. All that stuff. Okay. So, do people ha want to give a sense of the committee? Do people uh, any thoughts on this? 
I would just see look very carefully at the, I, I, I'm not sure that whether the final recommendation by one of the many committees and commissions that recommended 815, because again, there was a lot of pushback about pushing the high school release time later because of impacts on jobs, sports, other family so, responsibilities. So I, I would just, I would refer back to those and just find out whether. I think. There was a big debate as to whether 815 or 830 was the, was the, a doable time. The beauty of the proposal is it's really just a route and, and you could change the start time to anything, right? If you, you just start the schools at the same time and everything's delayed by it. So once they come up with the route, you can start at 6.30 a.m., you could start at 9.30 a.m., and everything just follows. So you guys can decide what time you want to start the bus plan. Well, Except we can't change elementary school start times. Right. That, so that, it does connect, these times. It does connect to that. And, and you have to also <laughs> oh, he didn't remember, tell me that. About, you have to remember okay. about the van pools, which yes. um, are a significant factor in, in designing this. And so, so yeah. So uh, if you there's can't. Some, there's some flexibility, but there's a remarkable if, amount of. If you can't change the elementary school start times, which was um, not, I didn't know that. I think no, I asked. Can. Um, then this doesn't work. It, well, that's what, have to be able that's to the MIT plan because they were basically going to change they were going to flip would, no flip. The, the, yeah. the way this would work if you started the high school at 815 or 830 I've looked at it enough to be able to say I think the elementary schools would have to be shifted back maybe 9 915 it's not a huge change and there's no flipping that was huge. That was. I'm, that just, was, saying, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Okay, but I'm saying so maybe that was from do it. from the from the community. One of the issues that we confronted was parents at the elementary school level saying, "You're making us suffer for no benefit." I, I at, at their level, and I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I, I I'm not representing you. this as my view. I'm just saying, in terms of in terms yeah. of you going forward with this, I, like that was a very strong sentiment at adjusting the end of the day. Yep. You know. But, but the way I remember it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is I remember that being a much bigger adjustment. No, we, our, our latest proposal was a 915 start for elementary school, okay. and that was a complete no starter. Okay. okay. Yes, Ms. This would be a hear this. Just one. <laughs> which is, if in an optimizational study you figure out how to save money, then, I mean, theoretically, I'm, I'm su I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk about such theoretical things. Like, I feel like I'm about to talk like the space-time continuum. But could the negotiation committee offer an MOA to have um, not teachers, like not, I mean, to have, to have um, uh, staff. staff, thank you, staff on site at the elementary school hmm. Um, for yeah, you, drop off or pick up. Well, oh, you don't. You, I'm not sure you would even need an MOA. The ESPs can start at whatever okay. time. So theoretically, we could say that the teachers start at 9:15, um, but drop off could. This is. I, I feel like I don't even want to say this, but I'm just kind of like like, mm -hmm. if string theory exists. Then, <laughs> but the start and end times are in the contract, so you couldn't alter the start and end time without altering the contract. I mean, well, you, I you, but isn't the start and I, I but that's true of so it just length of day. Length. So, is this really what this person is yeah. going to be doing? No, are they going to look into no. this level of minutiae where we're really just asking, no. taking someone's opportunity to give us some uh, something about alternative bus times, and we can they take can it put the times the as not. close together as possible. But, I'm, but, you, but the, but the and you parameters. Can give her some parameters around that, or she can come to those that were knowledgeable. Yeah, I mean, I think it seems like that's what we need to vote. They would on. probably ask for a community conversation to get input because that's how. Yeah, a, yeah I think I mean, I, because you don't want to. Again, we paid ten thousand dollars for somebody, and I felt like the parameters we gave them were errant, and then we spent ten thousand. So exactly. again, I, I wouldn't want to even send somebody for free off on something that didn't. Re and the other consideration is. We just signed a contract, and collapsing three tiers into two is not a, I think it's zero well, cost. Dr. Item, so. Provost and I talked about that, and he thinks it would still be three because um, of the back and forth between the high school and the middle school, but it would be a lot, it could potentially be a lot less okay. miles. And I mean, though, again, like, I have plenty to do, it's fine if yeah. I don't want to go down this if it's not going to help us learn, but it's a master's thesis. Mm -hmm. and. Yeah. 
if you learn about it and get ideas, I mean, often you'll start a project like this and you'll say, oh, I never thought of that. Maybe it's a little tweak we do that saves us money. You know, like, I don't he know could, where it She is. could just watch all of the uh, NCTV <laughs> meetings and, and that way we wouldn't even have to train them. You know, that would be the real data as to what went down, so. <laughs> so. Only take they make people in Gitmo watch this. <laughs> Torture. Uh, okay, so, so um, do you want to um, make a motion, or do you? What, what's your sense of this from hearing? Um, sure, I'll make a motion. Um, would you all like me to pursue <laughs> helping so, supervise a, a potentially, assuming this student who I've yet to meet um, <laughs> comes through, um, a theoretical project in exploring how? Um, we might optimize our bus system to enable uh, different start times and lower costs. Thank you. Second. Yeah. Okay. So there's been a motion. You're not really a motion to ask a question. It was a motion <laughs> to actually do it, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have a meeting in a week. If, okay. You know, I'll go if, if I'm so it's a, to. it's be, essentially it's a motion to authorize <laughs> Ms. Voss to pursue this opportunity with a UMass grad student. On behalf of us. On behalf of us. Yeah. Okay. Seconded. Any other discussion? That's the point to be sure. I miss, Mr. Moore touched on it. They have to be sure to look at all the special ed transportation because that was a big price tag in it because some of our kids are riding buses with other schools and if we have to take them off and put them on buses alone, our cost goes up. So they're not just looking at big yellow school buses. They're yep. looking at all special ed transportation too. Makes that, it bigger. That's helpful. Well, and I, I guess I have a question for you all if you don't mind and that is if it becomes beyond the scope of what's reasonable um, and they start with the bus routes just to learn about it and then we go back understanding them and seeing I mean I don't know I don't I have all those bus routes I have a stack of papers of all of them but they change every year too right so that's a big part of it yeah I, yeah I think um, I think I don't have any problems with that happening words, I don't have any problems with if we get a product that we didn't pay for that doesn't help us. But I, I do have a problem if we could have gotten a product that would have helped us, but we don't because we didn't provide the right information or the right guidance. So, so I would like very much that um, this be given every chance to be useful in terms of making sure that this graduate student understands all of the various inputs that are necessary, but I'm, I won't it's not a problem for me if having done that and given the right sort of inputs, the, the answer comes out to one that's not politically mm -hmm. feasible. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's fine. And, and it, you know, obviously I can't go email you all about this, right? So right. that's why it's on the agenda. But if anyone wants to be part of the discussion, especially some of you with more experience with this, I would welcome it. Mm -hmm. Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Any other discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Let us now turn to page two of the agenda. <laughs> Five of 11. Mary, you were right, the best part of <laughs> I was those kids. Yes. Um, okay, so now we have a discussion. This is a, a discussion that uh, our colleague, Mr. Kaufman, wanted to have for, re relative to executive session uh, meeting times. <laughs> Being too late at night. Most timely, <laughs> most timely agenda item. <laughs> um, ironically, I did want to discuss it. I would prefer to put this off at this point, really okay. because of everybody just being tired. I can just tell you that I, I, I wanted to just have an overall discussion about whether there was an openness and an interest to switching executive session times. I had a quick conversation with Ed and David at post the last meeting, and the suggestion was do some research. and bring it to the school committee for discussion. So I did some research. I'm happy to have a discussion. I don't think it's gonna be that short. So I'm, I'm ready to, if, if that's okay, I'm more than happy to push it till May. So we'll just, we'll just. Have fresher minds discussing. Okay, so we'll just, we'll just put this on the agenda for next time. There wasn't we need a vote. To vote on no, that? there wasn't a vote, so we'll just postpone the discussion, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Okay. Um, so now we have a sixth reading and vote on the naming of the Leeds Elementary Baseball Diamond in honor of Jim Myas, uh, and, um, and followed by uh, a similar vote for Ms. Clark. 
Do you want to make those motions? Sure. I'll move that we honor Jim Myas's contribution to the Leeds community over the last two decades and more by naming the baseball diamond at Leeds School in his honor as Myas Field. Okay. And Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Mr. Meyer. Um, and I would like to make a motion to name the pavilion that has been newly built on the playground side of Leeds School in honor of Ms. Julie Clark, who was a student at Leeds School, a parent of three children who went to Leeds, a grandmother of three who went to Leeds, and worked there as an administrative assistant for 27 years. And for her contributions, um, I would move that we name the pavilion in her honor. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Now we have a third reading on the request to name the Jackson Street Greenhouse in honor of Mary Bates. Um, so it's been read. So now we'll move on to the next item. Um, a first reading on a request to name the basketball court at Ryan Road, Legends Court. Um, some of you may recall that the part of the Part of the fundraising and the surplusing was the League Legends wanting to raise money to build this Legends Court to honor their fallen mm -hmm. classmates. So it's sort of, sort of the final piece of that whole project. So, did you want, have anything to say or just that um, the sponsors wanted to have this read this month to start the process? They would like to come at one of the six months um, to speak directly to their naming um, process. Okay. Um, Basically, it's just named after the organization. Okay, excellent. So, uh, next we have um, the report on the FY 2017 <coughs> end of year report audit from Ms. Walzik. I'll just summarize it. You've got the report. I think it came out to you early, so I'll give you a chance to look at it. There's a cover letter explaining the issues in the audit. This is something that happens each year once the report is filed with the Department of Ed. Okay. Any questions about the audit? Okay. Would you like to move on then to the uh, business administrator's report? Yep. Um, the standard monthly report is here. Um, we're continuing. There was a, a new area identified in the report for a deficit, the unemployment account. Um, I'm in the process right now of doing a complete review of our entire budget, and we'll have more detail you, for you, including the revolving accounts, at the May meeting as we go into the end of the year. Um, gifts. We have quite a few gifts from the... PTOs and accepted by the superintendent this month. So I'll read through these quickly. Um, from the PTO gifts accepted by the principals at Leeds School, there was a gift from School Sprouts of approximately $110 towards part of an invoice for the services that School Sprouts provides. They donated it to us in lieu of waiving a bill. At Ryan Road, Bridge Street, and Jackson Street, there were PTO gifts of $150 each towards a Symbolu software package. Well, he's probably left if you need to know what that is, but it's, it's software we've actually used for a couple of years at the elementary levels. Um, Bridge Street, there was a donation of $179 from the PTO for garden supplies. Jackson, donation from PTO for a bus trip to Smith College of $198. And then four, four additional gifts at Ryan Road, all four trips from the PTO. One was to Look Park, one was to Symphony Hall, one was to JFK and one was to the Connecticut Science Center, and those were close to $1,000 for those field trips. Gifts accepted from other parties by the superintendent. From Vanpool Transportation, they had donated a bus for the Special Olympics that was held for wheelchair vehicles um, that had a value of $350. From various local residents and businesses, there were donations totaling $385 to the athletic department, which were gifts in memory of Brad McGrath, um, that was listed in the newspaper, a longtime employee, coach, and employee here in the Smith Folk. Also to the athletic department was an anonymous donation of $999 to support the girls' ice hockey program. Bridge Street had donations from the parent community of books for the school library through a fundraiser that they did where the parents bought books for the library. They've estimated there's about a $500 value on those books. And then JFK had two gifts to the antique show which is put on here as a fundraiser for the after school program there was a $75 donation from Florence Pizza and Family Restaurant and $75 from Osberg and Associates towards the cost of putting on that antiques fair 
And then you have in your backup also three warrants that have been signed by your school committee reps since the last meeting. Okay. Personnel report. Uh, very short. We are winding down the school year, so fortunately there's not a lot of hiring going on. You'll just see that some subs came in and out, as is our normal practice. Um, and then we had one person transfer positions in the district. Okay. Thank you very much. Now we'll turn to the superintendent report. As you heard in the school business administrator report, we had an audit this month. But I want to say, wait, there's more. This has been uh, the accountability month for us for sure. Um, this month we had the opportunity to learn about the next generation accountability system that will replace the current um, system that was created to comply with race to the top. As you know, we're now in the post race to the top world. We're now in the ESSA world. And so the accountability system is being rejiggered to match the requirements of that federal legislation. Changes in the new system will include non test-based indicators that align with many areas that we have prioritized in our work. One of the new indicators is the percentage of 11th and 12th graders in AP, IB, dual enrollment, or honors math and science courses. While there are problems with the indicator, it doesn't include history, doesn't include languages, um, it does at least attempt to directly measure equity rather than trying to infer equity from test scores. Um, so I think that is a move in a positive direction. Um, we've uh, also been in discussion with the Department of Education concerning other equity indicators that go beyond testing to measure the actual learning experiences we're providing for students with disabilities. And in many of those which aren't really ready for um, public discussion yet, the questions looked at are do students have access to the same things? Um, so I think that, again, that's better than trying to infer from test scores whether the, the learning experiences were high quality. It's just saying, were the learning experiences the same as provided to non-disabled students? Um, so I think that um, will be interesting as that rolls out. Another new indicator will be chronic absenteeism. Chronic absenteeism <coughs> is defined as students missing 10% or more of their school days. So that would be 18 days for a student who's here for the entire year. And addressing chronic absenteeism has been part of our work since 2014 as part of the Nursing Care Coordination Program grant. And while we haven't been able to budge our absenteeism rate below 11.5%, the rest of the state has been trending upwards. So we're now better than 60% of the uh, public school districts and charter schools in the state on that indicator. Um, it's good that we sort of got out ahead of that. 80% of the new accountability system will still be based on test scores, but the scores will be weighted differently to place more emphasis on helping struggling students. In the new system, the performance of the bottom 25% of students will count for half of the overall rating. This non-categorical method uh, recalls Bob Pasternak's proposal to replace all the different eligibility categories we have for all the different federal programs with a single category called behind for whatever reason. Um, and my hope is that this disproportionate weighting, irregardless of programs or eligibility for other federal programs, will really help us to continue our tenacious pursuit of better outcomes for these students. Uh, turning to other accountability mechanisms, today we're concluding our mid-cycle coordinated program reviews with two days of on-site visits. Based on the issues that we experienced earlier this year, the document review, interview process, and observations scheduled uh, focused almost solely on Bridge Street School. Our DESE colleagues reported enjoying meeting with our staff and an appreciation for our vision about having a growth mindset and an interest in continuous improvement and programs in all our schools. And we also started MCAS testing. Um, ELA is almost done. You'll recall that we're doing computer-based testing in all grades except for third and tenth. The process has been efficient. I think we probably lost one student essay into cyberspace. Um, not too bad. Uh, we, we've had very few opt-outs this year. 
I've shared that under the new accountability system, schools with low par participation will be dropped to level five of six. In the prior system, they were dropped to level three if participation got below 95%. That was on a five level system. In the new system, they'll be dropped to level five if participation is less than 95%. And I don't know if sharing this information has made the difference, but I'm very grateful that nearly every student will be participating this year because the process does provide information that we can use to improve our schools. The most clearest example of that was our decision to invest in Math Investigations 3, a decision based in part on data showing that our elementary students weren't achieving in math at the same levels they were achieving at ELA. So as Mel Allen might say, this has been this month in accountability. <laughs> um, is it too much? Maybe. Um, but our families often ask whether and how we assess what we're doing. I hope it might help them to know that assessment is always ongoing. It takes multiple forms. It has multiple measures. It has multiple agencies and various levels of oversight. So we're looking closely at what we're doing and we're trying to use the process um, not to just take up all of our administrative time, but, but to be a learning experience so that we can make our programs better. Thank you, Dr. Provost. So we have no new business this evening. Uh, we have future business and meeting dates, the school committee meeting with the student advisory committee on May 10th at 645 here in the JFK community room, and then our regular meeting to follow on May 10th at 715 p.m. I would now entertain a motion, motion to, adjourn. to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. The meeting of the Northampton School Committee is now adjourned.